Is everybody in? Is everybody in? The ceremony is about to be begin. No judges, no trophies, no referees. One rule only, be friends at the end of the day. It is as if we are members of the same tribe preparing each other to stand together to defend our land, women, and children. If we go too hard on each other and someone is broken, we are weaker for it. If we go too softly on each other, again, we are not fully prepared to stand together to defend our land, women, and children. Our goal is that no one spends the night in the hospital. Our goal is that everyone leaves with the IQ with which he came. However, only you are responsible for you. No suing no one for no reason, for nothing, no how, no way. Protect yourself at all times. Only you are responsible for you. And all video copyright and related things to Dog Brothers Martial Arts Incorporated. Higher consciousness through harder contact. Good evening, folks. Welcome to FMA Discussion. This is episode 399. Yes, one before the big 400. Who would have known? And tonight, we're going to be featuring Dog Brothers, more specifically the East Coast and all that. Overall, we will be covering overall the Dog Brothers overall and DBMA as well. And we're going to be looking deep into that. Uh, for the guests tonight are Defender Dog, Steve Sachs, Foxhound, Matt Berry. And we're going to also go illuminate, illuminate the folks that may want to join the myth that you're going to go there and you're going to be wrecked and you're going to spend a night in the hospital when you're new. And uh, so we're going to be going over that stuff, too. And these, these guys are obviously going to speak certainly better on this than I am. Um, but, I, I, you know, I love these guys. Um, I had the pleasure of being around them three times. And I can assure you that three times they could have, or two, two of the three times, I should say, they could have absolutely uh, wrecked me. And, uh, and they were actually very nice. And um, um, so it definitely pushed me that my so-called comfort zone, you could say. But again, uh, we're going to be going into all that stuff. So if you're watching, tell us where you're watching from. Smash that like button, and we are going to get started. So without further ado. Hey, guys. Welcome. Going. Hey. How's it going? Good seeing all you guys. right. So you guys heard the intro. So before we get started on all that, for the folks that might not know, just um, kind of general martial arts background pre dog brothers and second question of this uh what are you currently doing now as far as other arts besides dog brothers uh i guess i'll even go first um <clears throat> uh when i was a kid i did karate um a little bit of kickboxing in my late team and i kind of gave it up um for the most part because i played team sports i grew up playing ice hockey and uh and then as an adult, I was playing rugby for a while. And I actually came back to martial arts through Dog Brothers. Um, I, for various reasons, decided I was going to fight in a gathering. And so I started training uh, with that purpose in mind. And after that first one, I got pretty, pretty hooked on it. So I kept going. Um, martial arts-wise, around that time, I got hooked up with Green Mountain Dog, uh, who was living in my area. And we did Akiti Teresha and uh, Udai Suwan, um, Kirby Krabang. Um, and then through training with him and, you know, having different training spaces, I started doing Muay Thai, uh, Marshall Muay Thai. Oh, um, shout out to Mark Meltzer. 
Um, I did Muay Thai there for a while. And then um, my teacher after that, who is now my current teacher again, Pete Fontaine, crack in Muay Thai. Um, and then for a minute I was in California. So um, I happened to be close to Mount at Sasa Prapa. So I trained Muay Thai under him as well. Um, and then I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, you know, to kind of round things out. I'm oh, sorry. I also I also train libre fighting. Um, my version of libre is slightly archaic compared to the guild um, stuff. I went through a little bit of an earlier version, of the distance learning program. Uh, but I keep I keep kind of current um, I'm on friendly terms with Scott, so uh, I stay in the loop. Um, but in terms of Kali, right now I'm mostly training DBMA with um, you know some other things that I've got mixed in there um, to keep it, you know, to keep it my flavor. But uh, yeah, for the, you know, my um, empty hand striking and, and my jiu-jitsu remain, you know, Muay Thai and jiu-jitsu, but in terms of um, my weapon stuff right now, it's it's a mix of DBMA and Libre. Okay, no, awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, same two questions for you, Steve. So, you know, grew up watching Kung Fu you know, flicks, ninja movies, you know, this is like back before Blockbuster. So it's like, you know, uh, you know, those are the days to get the videos and whatnot. And, uh, you know, as a kid, I did, um, I was really heavy into uh, Soku Ryu and Shotokan karate. Um, then uh, kind of hit puberty and there was a big hiatus in between. <laughs> um, then when I was in college, I got into a Jeet Kune Do school. So, you know, a little bit of everything was, you know, I know Sano Blend was the Kali art that I started with, you know, the Jeet Kune Do principles, you know, got the Muay Thai in there, boxing and uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Uh, we learned very, uh, at the like, uh, at the early times of BJJ, um, you know, under the Henzo Gracie umbrella, um, you know, then, then graduation happened and, you know, work happened and whatnot. So there's you know, big hiatus. And then, you know, I, I made my way back. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a guru in Dog Brothers martial arts now. Uh, you know, I, I train when I can. I mean, it's not the way how I'd, I'd like to be training. Um, you know, when I first started fighting in gatherings, it was so much preparation for the gathering, plyometrics, isometrics, this, that. It's like you had to do everything. You had to be perfect to get prepared for the gathering. And, uh, it's come to the point I've been fighting so much that, that the gathering is just part of the training. You know, I just don't have what it takes to really prepare the way I used to. Um, but it, it took a long time in my evolution as a fighter and, and people who, you know, train with me. You know, I try to guide them the same way where they start to realize that after many years, it's like, yeah, the, the gathering is just part of the training. Uh, and without it, I'd be lost. So. <laughs> Okay, no, no, thank you both. Um, if we got some folks watching in. Yes, if you're watching, tell us where you're watching from. And we have, all right, and we got a question. We got Eric O'Brien, Florida. John Kleinman's here. Um, and we got John Kuspis with a good question. I'll definitely get that asked, brother. He's an Amon brother. Um, we got Terry from Stockton. Nick Merchant, who's that guy? Um, and we got Frank. I've heard of that guy. It's trouble. He, I tell you, you have no idea. He's like, you know, I always have to discipline him Piper and have to talk to him. He just doesn't follow rules. And it's just, you know, I don't know if they do with Nick. <laughs> um, I find hitting him with a stick is a great motivator. That, that, yeah. The, yeah. The problem is, though, I don't know if that's going to work with me. Uh, we got Frank. We got Fred Reese, Ryan Thomas, Florida. And Kurt from Alaska. All right, all right, folks. Um, so okay, um, what? Okay, so uh, we'll start with uh, back to Matt. Um, what led each? You know, this is going to be for both of you, of course. Um, but what led you to the calling, if you will, to um, seek out uh, Dog Brothers? Was it invitation? Your friends <laughs> told you about it? Something you saw on uh, YouTube, and you're like, I got to get some of this. Uh, like, what was each? Um, of your poem, so. Well, um, I don't know. I, some some people already know this story, but not everyone does. And for those that don't know the story but know me a little bit, it's going to make sense. Um, so, like, I don't know, 2009 or something, I think I, I 
saw like the National Geographic um, Dog Brothers special and, and uh, another highlight video from 09, uh, which, you know, featured some guys who I would soon be, well, not soon, but I would eventually be calling brother, uh, just mm. absolutely going ham. Um, I had never seen people do essentially MMA with weapons before. And mm. At the time, I uh, I had been training knife already. I, I came to the knife uh, because of some real real life stuff that had gone on, and um, I decided I wanted to start to um, you know go down that path a little bit, and um, you know eventually it led me to seeing Dog Brothers, and uh, you know I bought some like foam sticks from like Karate Depot or something along those lines, and uh, one one day at a family like barbecue kind of thing. My cousin and I had a couple too many Sam Adams and we took these padded sticks out on my lawn and you know somebody had a, a early camera phone and they filmed it and they put it on YouTube and they um, they tagged Dog Brothers. And I got a really nasty DM from uh, from a guy uh, calling me some names and, and suggesting that I was a disgrace and uh, you know I should be talking about things I didn't know anything about, whatever, and it really rubbed me the wrong way. And I was like, you know what, man? Uh, F you. Um, you know, I, I would fight you if I could. And he was like, well, that's handy. Um, my name is Toki. I'm going to be at the Dog Brother Gathering in September. It's an open. Anyone can sign up. If you want to fight, we can do it there. And I was like, all right, bet. <clears throat> and this was probably like, you know, January, March, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm going to fly 3,000 miles and I'm going to fight this guy. So I bought some rattan sticks um, off of Empire Training Blades, which I don't think exists anymore. And, uh, and I bought a fencing mask that I never put on until the day of the gathering. And I found a tire on the side of the road, hung that thing up in my backyard. Um, I found some, some videos on YouTube that broke down some basic collie. Shout out to Vampire. That guy's awesome. Um, he taught me having six. Uh, he taught me some other, like... Him on YouTube. What? What's that? Him. I forgot about he's him. He's still he's still out there. He's a good guy. Um, we were going to do an episode of my podcast, and uh, it's some technical difficulties, and then I kind of went on hiatus. But he's a, good, he's a good dude. I can connect you if you ever want to. I, I, no, I, I um, actually, I would love to, if you don't mind. He was always no, absolutely. Okay, yeah, yeah. I've, I've told him before. I like, I actually owe. I'm like, dude, I actually owe you. You started my collie journey. Uh, so yeah, I just you know hit a hit a tire in the backyard and and got real angry and uh, you know flew out to California not knowing what I didn't know. And, <clears throat> um, luckily for me, uh, growling dog, wandering dog, dirty dog, um, dog Howie, rest in peace. Uh, a couple other guys happened to be at the same hotel that I was staying at um, and took me under wing because they realized what an idiot I was uh, with absolutely no experience in Kali. Mm -hmm. or, like, I was playing rugby. I was like, I'm going to run into this guy as hard as I can. I'm going to tackle him. I'm just going to beat his ass right there. Um, that is not how it went. He stabbed me in the taint with a um, training knife that I didn't realize he had and I didn't understand what was going on. But it actually made the highlight video, so there's that. Um, <laughs> and uh, I also, I know we were talking about how new people, you know, shouldn't be afraid that they might spend the night in the hospital. But I don't know if you can see, you know, hold it up in front of black. I'm missing this entire chunk off of my hand. That was day one. Um, I, took a, I took a, a stick right there. This perfectly fits an inch and an eighth. Oh. That's how I. That's how I measure my sticks now to make sure I'm the right <laughs> size for fighting in a gathering. Is like. If it fits in that hole, I'm good. It's also good for shooting pool left-handed. I can rest it right in there. Um, but yeah, uh, I decided that day. I was like, "This is for me. Like, this is I. I'm gonna have to learn how to do it." Um, but the atmosphere was right. Um, I'm a mediocre rugby player at best, so I, I felt like you know I could um, transition into something else. Pretty pretty guilt-free at that point. I played. I was probably 26, um, and uh, yeah, the rest was history. Uh, this is 13 years of gatherings for me. Um, wow! So I, okay. 
Yeah, hmm. I'm I'm planning to do I'm I'm planning on twenty, and we'll see what happens after that. But yeah, yeah. Um, yep. So you uh, interesting. You played the cross because I played in college. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah, I played defense. If you ever watch me staff fight, uh, I'm just doing all the stuff that used to get me. I was a midi, so yeah. I played attack. Okay. Yeah, there we go. We got a whole oh. team. Hey, oh, I was going to say, right here. <laughs> right back and forth. <laughs> Just so I remember. Yeah. <laughs> one, of, uh, one of the first things that my lacrosse coach told me when I started playing defense, he goes, there's no penalty for spearing. I go, what? He goes, you can jab a guy in the body as hard as you want any time. Mm. So, oh. Um, so, yeah, anytime somebody came at me with the ball, I never even looked at their stick. I jammed them in the guts and then flicked my stick out. And almost every time it would, you know, hit the bottom of their stick. Uh, I was chaotic, though. I, I hit a lot of people in the head. Spent a lot of time in the sin. That's funny. <laughs> wow. And um, Steve, same question for you. But you pretty big for putting for an attack. I, I would figure you as a defender. Oh, uh, I'm, you know, I'm bigger now. But as a kid, I was, uh, was actually really skinny, scrawny, but strong. I think oh, okay. uh, my junior year, freshman year, junior year. Uh, that summer before I went into my senior year, I think I was 117, 118 pounds, but I was strong. Wow. Like, you know, you could do okay, like you really a lot of push ups, a lot of squats, wow. lift heavy weight, and I started taking like protein shakes and lifting weights. And I think in that summer I put on like 25 pounds, and I was still a minor, so I was getting my physical for school, and. Um, the doctor talks to my mom's like, uh, um, I'm pretty certain your son's on steroids. <laughs> and my mom's <laughs> like, no, I check all his drawers. I listen to all his phone conversations. I'm like, yeah, my mom, trust me. She has that on lockdown. She's like, well, we, we want to test them anyway, but we need your consent. So, uh, yeah, I, you know, I never messed around with steroids or anything. But, yeah, you know, I, I was not that big. And, and, you know, I was looking. It's funny now because this is my, my bedroom, you know, uh, my parents' house where I grew up. Um, and I'm like looking at old pictures of myself when I was 12 and my son is 12 now. It's like, oh, wow, my son, like, if we went in a time machine, he would just destroy me <laughs> as a 12 year old versus 12 year old. Oh, you were that. Oh, you were thin. I didn't. Wow, yeah, I yeah, yeah. Say, looking at you now playing attack. I'm thinking, I'm just looking at you now and just yeah. making an association of, yeah, like, you know, but, uh, but uh, yeah, as far as, you know, martial arts, you know, as far as getting, you know, into Dog Brothers, it was, you know, in college, uh, progressive martial arts, you know, Nick Sekoulis, Raw Dog. Mm -hmm. uh, I was able, unlike Matt, to come up in a school where there was a handful of guys who have fought in gatherings or events, you know, maybe a little lower key than a gathering. Mm -hmm. so, you know, there's maybe about four or five people who I was able to train with him. When I first joined the school, I'm like, you know, absolutely not. Like, it was crazy, but I'd like to learn it. Um, but, you know, after a couple of years, you know, you do all these, uh, you know, the Sinwali patterns and, and Hubbub and Sinwali drills. And it's great. It looks cool. You know, it looks flashy. But, you know, uh, you know, I was very well aware that this is not fighting. You know, and what of this could I actually apply in a fight? Yeah. And then, uh, like you're playing the, the the first series VHS tapes, is very you know eye opening. It's like, oh, okay, so this is what it is, and mm. this is you know the 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 athletic attributes and, and the raw power and combining stick with footwork, and you know these are the next elements of taking kind of those drills and making them you know more functional for the fighting arena. You know, I feel like what I learned in the beginning, like those drills are more like for me longer term development. I mean, it's great to learn all the, the coordination drills of, of Heaven Six and, and whatnot. And, you know, just to get my checking hand working, like from all those sobriety mm -hmm. drills, it was like years of fighting before, you know, when, when someone else is trying to take your head off where you're actually able to, like, get in and get one check in and, and hit. It's like, whoa, I, you know, I got something working in checking range. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it was through that. It was through uh, that school and, you know, the first – I watched, you know, like Matt, like I didn't do any keyboard, you know, challenges, keyboard warrior challenges that actually went out and came to fruition. You know, I went to a gathering, went out to uh, California. And uh, like I was mentioning yesterday, the, the one fight that I remember in particular, I'm sitting on the floor and I see sled dog 15 feet away mounting someone. And he had a dos manos uh, 
grip on, on his stick and he's just like, vampire slaying. Raw! Uh, and like after the third one, and it's like you can feel the stick going through the guy's like torso and like sticking into the ground. I'm like, whoa! I want to do yeah. that. But, but you know what it is? It, it was also it's one thing watching the tapes and, and getting a vibe, which was very important, but actually going there and interacting with everyone. It's like, you know, everyone was so different, diverse, but everyone was so cool, so welcoming. You know, everyone's trying to take your head off, but in a respectful way, like they're literally trying to help each other. I'm like, wow, this is, this is interesting, you know, and I, uh, mm -hmm. you know, took off from there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can kind of piggyback off, uh, you know, like uh, the diversity and everybody. I mean, the first time where I met you guys officially, hit the crap out of cancer. I think it was November in New York. There, I mean, that's I one of the things that really stood out for me, besides the fights, was like, wow, these guys are just so down to earth. I'm like, it just these guys are just like really good, like welcoming people to hang out with, and just and I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's. Um, we got a question. I had the same question that Ryan sent in. And first gathering experience. So we already kind of heard a little from you, Matt, on this, your experience. Uh, anything that we missed on that first experience? Um, oh, yeah. I mean, I came at it from stupid uh, because I just went there to fight one guy. And I really didn't have... Um, I didn't have as much of a frame of reference. Like, I think if I had known more, I never would have done that. Like, if I knew a little bit better, oh, if, I had, like, one, no, if no. I had, like, one year of real Kali experience, I would never have had the – I would have never thought to go to a Slacker. gathering like that. Yeah. No way, not like that. Um, no, definitely. It was because I didn't know better. Um, but, yeah, there's some things. Um, number one, the adrenaline dump uh that happens at like the first exchange is mm. something that i wasn't ready for that that very first like it's a feeling i'm really familiar with now and i can almost control like i can almost just do it you know what i mean like it sounds kind of funny but i can almost just like think for a few minutes and get myself into that state um without like having any real preamble to it but um but then I, the smell of rattan for the first time, like being in a, was the, my first gathering was at Gokors. Um, and like I said, I hadn't really, like I had done some sparring with a padded stick, but I had never done real live rattan sparring. And uh, I didn't, I only had one fencing mask, so I didn't have anybody really to spar with anyway um, at first. So I, I didn't really know anything about the smell. And so the first, uh, the first time I was standing near a couple of guys that were really doing some hard, you know, some Sinawali and some footwork and I smelled it. I was like, Oh boy. And then, you know, so for me where I had never come from, um, like a school that smelled like that, uh, mm. I've always associated that smell immediately with fighting, like mm. real fighting. Um, so I wasn't entirely prepared for, um, all the, all the bits and pieces, but at the same time, um, I mean, I, like, the camaraderie part didn't really come till later, except I could, like, I got a glimpse of it in the way that these guys treated me when they found out, like, when they heard my story the night before the gathering when we were sitting in the bar and I just met all these guys. They were like, wait a minute, you don't know what you're doing at all? I was like, no, no, I'm going to kick this guy's ass. So I'm <laughs> and uh, they were like, oh, my God, you're an idiot, but you're our kind of idiot, like... No, well, come with us. Kind of you're our kind of idiot. You come with us. So they took care of me right off the bat, and they, they made me feel like I was a part of the group. Um, there's a photo that surfaced recently from, yeah. um, from you know, wherever we went for burgers afterwards. I don't even remember the place. Uh, my hand is all bandaged up. The Kaju dog was the one that wrapped it up. And, and I'm surrounded by all these people, and um, some of them are people that I've now known for, for over a decade. And there's other people that I never saw again. Um, but just the, the feeling that I got from that very first day was so similar to how I felt being on a rugby team. Where I was like, I think, you know, I think I could do this. So I, I, 
My first impressions were good. I, not everybody has a great first gathering, right? But I really, um, despite not uh, exactly coming out and kicking ass, uh, I've since buried the hatchet with Toki personally. We don't have any interpersonal issues. No, oh, that's any longer, um, but that's good. You're not. I mean, we kicked we kicked him out of Dog Brothers, but, oh, <laughs> but I don't have a problem with him anymore. But um, I, don't, I personally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. So that's uh, okay. That's mine. I don't know. So Steve, same question. Like your first gathering experience. Like, uh, like what was it like? Oh, it was it was, uh, it was awesome. Actually, I was dating my wife at the time. She actually came out. And watched uh, some California Holy Grounds. I think it was con- it was considered at the time the last you know open uh, gathering in the park. Um, there has oh, been the field a- there. Okay. Um, so you know I was kind of just catching the vibe. I was just my- myself and uh, my instructor Raw Dog Nick Sakulis. And, you know, I started asking people for for fights. It's like, oh, I got like three people lined up, but you could be the fourth one and. You know, he saw I wasn't getting any fights right away. Um, and he turns to a guy sitting down. He's like, hey, you want to fight my student? Yeah. And turns out he's like one of the biggest guys there. And he looks scary as, as heck. Uh, if you're familiar with him, Tate Fletcher, who's gone on <laughs> to have an amazing, um, you know, stunt career. And, you know, he's got acting roles now. If you watch like The Mandalorian, the opening, uh, uh you know, first season, the first episode, he's in there like fighting and whatnot. He, you know, it's a scary dude. And when I fought him, I was 155 pounds and he was a big dude. Um, so that was an awesome experience. I mean, uh, fighting someone that big and that scary looking, <laughs> um, you know, it was very transformative for me. It's like, wow, like that went pretty well, you, you know, Um you know, a lot of mutual respect. I'm still trying to get the video from those fights. That that actually might come to fruition after uh, over 20 years. <laughs> um, then, you know, I had a couple more fights that day. And then I remember I was lined up to go with True Dog, uh, uh, Cliff. Uh, um, Chris Clifton. Yes, thank you. And um, I was looking forward to that fight. And then the cop showed up and shut us down, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, huh. Is he still? Uh, you know, I was, I was hooked. You know, I really was. You know, with, without it, I'll be honest with you, I'd be a, a much different person. I guess, you know, growing up, I've always been a good kid, but, you know, I got into trouble just hanging around the wrong kids and whatnot. And just, I remember growing up, there's just a lot of times where you want to release and, and do stuff, but you hold back because you kind of know what you're capable of and you're kind of afraid to go there type of thing. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I knew I had that in me and I didn't want to like kind of release it at the wrong times. And this is something that gave me in a, in a healthy way, the ability to kind of release it all in a controlled manner, uh, you know, with a group of people who could help guide me and help channel that energy in a, in a good way. That's a good um, man. That's profound the way you put that. That's like you had it. You know, you had it in you. It's just you were waiting for the right time and right people to help kind of guide it. I mean, that's yeah. that's real stuff. When you um, hey, you know, when I went, this is about twenty years ago when I go train with Mark Denny, and but I remember it was in that field when I went. I did the weekend thing, and then why did they shut it down? Like, wh- wh- what happened? Uh, there was, I think, I think it was. I'm pretty certain it was that gathering. Um, you know, kind of like Matt's stories, you know, it's really more about respect, right? It's, you know, be friends at the end of the day, you know, but you're also supposed to start as friends too. <laughs> um, you know, even though it's not explicitly stated, but that's kind of what it is. You want to, yeah. So, uh, yeah. This particular uh, event, um, there's two guys who are local bouncers and one of them was a, a shoot wrestler. And, um, I know he was fighting Raw Dog and, you know, shoot wrestling. A lot of times they'd start standing up and they just drop down into like a knee bar. Great. But, you know, Nick had a stick and it went to the ground and he's going for a knee bar. And he's like simulating, like, just let go of the knee bar. I'm not going to tap. I'm going to crack your head open. And his friends in the crowd saying, break his fucking leg. Oh, man. And like, you know, we're not going to jump in because it is what it is. This is your fight. And, you know, the ringmaster is really not going to do anything either. 
Uh, it is what it is, right? So the guy really should have let go of the knee bar because it's like, you know, I'm simulating cracking your head open, let it go. But, you know, he put on the knee bar really hard and then, you know, Nick cracked him in the head. He started bleeding and it got a little rough. And uh, I, I don't know exactly what happened, but you know, later on the cops came, I guess. And I think it might have been something that was in there, but something like that's very rare to happen at a gathering that was i fought at many many gatherings watched many gatherings talked to many people yeah there's some weird things that do happen that that was definitely an anom anomaly uh that was something like all right goodbye leave <laughs> don't come yeah, back yeah yeah the guy's cranking a knee bar while getting yeah started. so yeah. you know so you know it was unfortunate you know that the that it got shut down and then mm. from there you know open gatherings were then taken indoors only and that was kind of around the time when tribal gatherings were starting. So then, you know, the tribal gatherings would still be outside. That's, you know, tribe members only. You know, you fight at a few gatherings, all the full dog brothers vote you in. You know, the first level is dog. Then later, you know, candidate dog brother, and you could designate a name for yourself. And then uh, full dog brother. You know, that's, you know, many gatherings uh, of fighting. You know, you would probably mm -hmm. fight two dozen fights or so before you could possibly you know, get up there. Um, right, right, right. It was always just, like I said, I was always curious, you know, why they shut that place down and uh, well, uh, certainly makes sense now. Um, next question for you guys is, um, you guys are kind of, uh, you know, as far as um, your, how many gatherings in your years and um, is there any, uh, one, give me like your, uh, for each of you, uh, one personal experience from any gathering that just for whatever reason just stands out. Um, so uh, Matt, one like one oh, uh, one memorable experience that just stands out. Oh yeah, no, I'll, I'll make it a funny one. Um, <clears throat> I have I have a lot, man. I don't know. I probably <laughs> I'm probably closing in on 150 fights, something like that. Um, so I'm I'm not. I got a lot of them, but. Uh, Back in the day when um, people were starting to get into using the, the axe, we all started getting these cold steel axe trainers. Mm. Um, and some of us started modifying them. Like when I use one, I cut the spike off um, for variety of a whole bunch of reasons why. If anybody wants to talk about tomahawks, they can find me. We can talk about axes all day. But um, Gray Dog and I had a series of three tomahawk fights over three successive gatherings and um he was like hitting his peak and i was a little be i was probably like a candidate dog brother um it wasn't a full dog brother yet and he had uh taken a couple of these axes and he had actually removed the heads and fabricated his own heads that were a slightly different shape they had like a longer beard and, and no points on the top and then he had taken the handles and he had put them in the oven and he had lengthened them a little bit and then uh, conformed them to his arm so he could choke up on, on one and it would uh, cover his forearm and his knuckle. And he had like a striking surface and a blocking surface. And then he would mm -hmm. use the other one long. And uh, <clears throat> I had a period of years where I used to fight in a kilt. Uh, I don't do it anymore because of the stupid thing comes off sometimes and um, people get really upset when you mount a triangle them while you're wearing a kilt and then elbow them in the face because they can't see um that's we call that the boston tea party um but uh so I, i'm gonna fight brett and and i think i had maybe a um a tomahawk and a sword and he had two um two of these like modified tomahawks and through the course of the fight, he managed to disarm both of my weapons, pull off both of my gloves, and rip my kilt off. Um, I was at the point where, like, I needed to take off my helmet and, like, throw that at him. Uh, but that was one of the – his skill level had, was still so far ahead of mine um, that he made me look like a complete dumbass. But uh, – yeah, no, there's no butt to that one. He just made me look like a dumbass. Yeah, That's yeah, one that really yeah. stands out. You know, it was fun. It was fun because it brought a like. I've got a lot of serious fights, um, and for that one, despite the fact that it still really hurt to get hit with those axes, uh, 
you know, that, that brought more laughter than anything else. Um, I do encourage people to, to spar with things other than sticks. I mean, a stick fight is a stick fight. You're, you're in a fight, you have a stick, and that's how you need to handle it. But, um, you know, most of us who train Kali do at least train it with the idea of the sword or the blade or the stick represents any weapon or whatever. So, you know, getting in there with an axe or um, even a chain or something like that, if that's how, you know, you're particularly defective. Connor Wood or Ice Dog or Dungeon Dog, I'm talking to you guys. Um, you know, just, it's I, I highly encourage other things. And, uh, yeah, different. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Steve, most memorable experience? So, yeah, that, that, that fight with, with Tate Fletcher was definitely one of them. Uh, and I'd say another big one was after a long hiatus coming back. I don't know. It might have been. The, 14 or 15 year hiatus in fighting. Um, I came back and um, I fought Catch Dog as my first fight. And I didn't realize his name was Catch Dog. And I didn't think he was a full dog brother. Um, and I didn't realize his size either. He was sitting down and, you know, he's got his nice, sweet face, like like a, you know, like a, <laughs> a nice, friendly smile. Like you wouldn't think that he'd be, you know, a vicious fighter. So I'm like, oh, it's a good way to like ease back in. You're sitting around other guys at the at dog level, and um, it was a, it was a really good fight. You know, some some good technical stuff in the beginning, and you know, I'm, I think I landed a shot on his collarbone as he simultaneously hit me in the side of my ear and popped my eardrum. <laughs> um, you know, you learn very quickly not to block with your head, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's a lesson that was very well received in that moment. Uh, then something that we always learn for, from the grappling arts, you know, standing headlocks, you know, are, are, you know, like a cardinal sin. And it's like, as much as I knew not to do it and I wouldn't do it in a submission grappling match when the adrenaline's pumping and you're trying to, you know, puño sewn in the head, the next thing, you know, you got the standing headlock. And, uh, again, I didn't know he was a catch wrestler. I didn't realize his, his strength, you know, he almost suplexed me. I was lucky. <laughs> I was able to you know, break his grip and just drop down to the, to the ground and have him, you know, uh, simulate slicing my throat instead. <laughs> but that was, a, that was, uh, and, and again, what, what makes it unique is, Oh, I didn't lose the fight. Like I learned so much from that fight, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and the camaraderie from it and the fights that we've had together after that. And we, you know, we reminisce over the years going back. I mean, it's just, it's tremendous. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Okay, next question for both of you. Uh, you're, you kind of already touched upon that. You doing um, tomahawk, or whatever, but different weapons or configurations you got to have uh, experimented with within uh, gatherings. So, man. Um, yeah, I mean, I like uh, I do um, a spotty daga. Uh, the buckler has become a pretty big, um, mm. pretty big thing for some guys. I know my clan, like everybody has one. Um, we train pretty, pretty extensively stick and buckler. We use Lonely Dog's uh, stick and buckler system. Um, he's got a pretty, pretty solid DVD that sort of outlines the way he uses it. The historical use of his uh, stick and buckler doesn't really translate to our style of fighting in the same way. So Lonely Dog has codified it for stick fighting, which is pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> staff, uh, you know, I, I like I said, I, I recommend getting out there and doing some sword sparring as well. Mm. Um, I personally avoid whips and chains. Uh, I don't believe those are for the gym uh, or the, you know, fighting surface. Um, but there are some guys that are pretty into that stuff. Um, I've seen uh, some pretty gnarly chain fights. Um, Dungeon Dog and, and Ice Dog uh, are sick, sick individuals. And they both really enjoy that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I, I stay away from that kind of stuff. Um, you know, the days always start with a knife fight. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that, the uh, knife fighting, you know, we call it sport knife dueling. It's really, you're just playing tag and, and those, those bouts are mostly just literally to warm up. I was going to um, say, you use them as warm ups, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's a warm, it's a warm up thing for the most part. It's fun. I actually, I'm like decent at it 
so I, I really enjoy it, but um, I know that it's it's not the same thing as a stick fight, uh, mm. doesn't have the same connotation, and I feel like people uh, don't always treat the knife fights with the same respect and reverence that they do with other things. Um, some yeah. some guys do. I mean, by the time you're a full dog brother, it's a whole other story. But you know, at a, at a yeah. gathering, there's the majority of people there are not full dog brothers. It's, you know, yeah, it's a smattering. A smattering, and it's mostly people yeah. in the ranks. But um, yeah, no, I, I mean, <clears throat> so aside from those other things, the axe really has been my mm. sort of uh, pet pet okay. thing yeah. for for years. Um, I really like uh, the tomahawk and the axe, and, and learning um, <clears throat> that kali doesn't really work. You see, guys, and uh, if you're out there doing kali with an axe and teaching it people being like this is how you use an axe to fight you're doing all this flowy stuff shame on you because uh, that's not how it works um, mm. they stick together they hook um, it's it, I've um, I'm not trying to pitch anybody's product or, or um, hawk my own things right now but I'm uh, in the process of designing the combatives course for the Empress Tomahawk with Wingard wearables Mm. So I've um, I've done a pretty decent amount of testing um, on meat and other um, <laughs> other materials with a couple of different kinds of axes, and the idea that you're going to use an axe in the same way that you use a sword or a stick is stupid. Uh, it's not how it works. So anyway, um, yeah. Sorry. That was no, 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 no. I, just to piggyback on what you said, I pers I mean, I'm not I'm not really good at it yet. Um, you know, but I, I enjoy the buckler and stick. I'm I'm very green at it. I'm just playing around with it, but it's it's fun. You know what I mean? Um, so, folks, buckler's kind of fun. Um, okay, same question for you, Steve. Like uh, any like different things you've played around with, as far as other than stick? Pretty much the same. You know, array of what Matt just discussed. Um, I, you know, for me, I think my my favorite is you know double stick. You know, I think it's kind of the epitome of what we do as Kali practitioners and not everyone's versed in actually making it work. Mm -hmm. um, I think staff, staff has been, uh, I've only had one staff fight, but let me tell you something that's, uh, <laughs> that's pretty damn intense when you start swinging that thing with, with power and, and gusto. Um, I would say with Buckler, yeah, it's a nasty weapon because, you know, using it to punch and if you hold it on the side and you're punching with the edge of it just nasty yeah i personally don't like fighting with it much for me like i i feel like it develops the habit of me learning to block with my hand since it's such a small shield but i've kind of adapted my double stick fighting to fight as if i'm fighting stick and buckler and now it's easy for me to think of this hand as the buckler now this hand's the buckler right mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like the, the dose tree case material. You know, I like to think of it in that respect. I'd say I probably fought more of the odd weapons, you know, fought against like, you know, three section staff and double nunchuck and against chains and all kinds of different things. But um, I never fought against a whip yet. <laughs> I'm saying I would. That would be, that would be interesting. Huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, with, with the whip, you know, if, it, if it's a short whip, and someone's really good at cracking it, you know, it's really hard to get in. You know, a lot of the earlier fights with whips were, you know, much longer whip. As long as you could, you know, crash through that last inch or two of the whip, you're good. Yeah. But then what happens when the guy's holding a knife now, right? So, yeah, and he pulls I, in and then you go into his, what he really wanted you to come into. You know? Yeah, exactly. But over the years, yeah. people have gotten really good with, with all these weapons, yeah. with the three-section staff, different influence, with whips and chains. And, like, how do you really make this – you know, work against different weapons. So it's been, yeah. it's been kind of unique, you know. No, I think no, we've seen no. it all at gatherings. We've seen people fight with chairs, two by fours, hockey sticks, rubber Those big fish, dog bones. Dog bones. Yeah. <laughs> big rawhide dog that bones. Freaking Fox, yeah. frying pans. <laughs> yep. Frying pan. Yeah. Garden wow. hoses. This um this question is for you. So this is Ryan's second question for both of you. And this question is, has your lens on the martial arts world before dog bar fights and now, has it changed? Has your lens changed as far as the overall martial art world 
before dog blood fight and now now that you guys have you know fought for a number of years has your lens changed on the overall martial arts world oh yeah big time big time um so i i was an mma fan basically from the beginning as soon as i you know as soon as i could start finding the vhs tapes at blockbuster but um so I already, I already had an idea <clears throat> that a lot of what people were learning when they were training martial arts probably wasn't actually going to work if they were fighting someone that knew how to fight. Um, <clears throat> and I probably intellectually, if you had like said, well, what do you think about weapons? I would have been like, oh, same thing. Like, you know, someone that just is, um, you know, someone that's just doing these pattern drills and footwork drills and never applying it in sparring probably isn't going to be able to pull it off when it matters. <clears throat> so that's something that, you know, I maybe have to see it in person. But um, I think I, I, I didn't entirely grasp um, – I didn't, I didn't make this phrase up, but <clears throat> the fact that martial arts is a vehicle for unlocking human potential. Um, I, I don't think I realized that until I came to fighting the dog brothers because I had never had a goal. Like I have never been somebody who cared about ranks or belts or anything like that. Like it's just not, doesn't matter to me. If you can fight, you can fight. If you, if you know the thing, you know the thing. Um, that was one of the things that appealed to me about Muay Thai. I mean, Muay Thai, one, as soon as I was exposed to it, like I, I you know, I, got home from my first class and I found a copy of Ong Bak and I watched Tony Jaw and I was like, yes, Muay Thai, right? I don't need karate. <laughs> um, but, you know, when it came to Kali, I, I had only ever really seen it as, because um, again, this is, you know, 2008, 2009. Um, I had only seen it as kind of guys doing, you know, basic, basic stuff or sombrata or, you know, something like that. So, I hadn't seen it as, as a combative art at all, really. Um, and then, and, and seeing Week Half, I, you know, kind of, you know, ruffle feathers or anything, but that appealed to me about as much as uh, mayonnaise milkshake, um, which is to say not at all. Uh, so I, it took me seeing kind of FMA through a lens similar to FMA. I'm sorry. It took me seeing FMA through a lens similar to MMA um, mm -hmm. to to really, you know, sort of cement my own martial philosophy. Um, it, I am a little bit better tempered uh, in my old age as I as I grow up uh, a little bit than I have been in the past. I'm not as likely to want to. Um, challenge someone to a fight immediately when they start talking about how good their collie is. But I do also keep two fencing masks in my car at all times. <laughs> just saying, um, you know, just I, always, I, just be, always. I just want that to be no, you know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. We got uh, John and Kurt, I got your questions. I, so I definitely got them written down and I'm definitely going to get to them just so uh, you guys are not, uh, and actually John's yours is coming up uh, pretty soon. Um, same, uh, same question for you, Steve. So, yeah, I mean, my, my start fighting started doing, uh, you know, karate. It was uh, Kusoku Ryu and Shotokan and, you know, off, off camera. You know, I'm at my parents' house today, so it's my old bedroom. You know, in the corner, I have a whole stack of trophies and, you know, these big trophies and everything and the medals and the ribbons and everything. And uh, I remember I was telling you off air earlier, you know, my son saw him a couple of years ago. Oh, Dad, we got to bring him to our house and dust them off and put them all over the place. I'm like, eh, not really. Like, they don't really mean a lot to me. Well, can I have them? Yeah, you could have them. And I was like, wait, actually, no, you can't. I earned them. Go earn your own. <laughs> but, but with that sentiment, yeah, they still mean a lot to me because, you know, they made me mentally stronger and, and you know, they helped guide me through my, my youth. But as many trophies as I had, it didn't really teach me how to fight. And I'm not saying I was a violent kid, but, you know, I've seen in, in New York, you see plenty of violence in the streets. And, you know, like I said, when I was a little younger, I hung around some of the, the wrong kids and I ended up in fights just because of the people who I hung out with, you know, type of thing. 
And it's like I knew what I learned as a kid. It's like, uh, you know, you know, first of all, fights are, you know, you're getting outnumbered. There's weapons involved and doing traditional type of karate. Like, you know, we do this traditional karate with deep stances and everything. And you get out and fight and you're like doing this bouncing around kickboxing stuff. So it's like what we're training isn't really applying to how we're fighting as it is. Um, so, yeah, it really wasn't until I got into... You know, I did a little bit of Muay Thai, I never like fought in the ring or anything, but, you know, in the gym and everything, you know, it's a little bit more real and boxing and whatnot, but it wasn't until a gathering, you know, I mean, it's, you're, you know, you're full on adrenal uh, and it's just you and another person out there. And uh, that's what I really learned how to fight. And I developed a big appreciation for it. You know, it's when the UFC was kind of in its infancy mm. didn't really have the internet. So it's like you had a couple of videos here and people would share videos and, you get VHS tapes of. Bumping. I remember that they were sharing, they were going around. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. It's like you know, you know, you know, you. It's whatever violence you're exposed to, but again, it's how do you how can you train for that violent situation, but in as controlled format as possible, and that's you know what the Dog Brothers gave me, and if anything, it, it's humbled me more. People are like, oh wow, Steve, you could kick ass and this and that. I'm like. Yeah, you know what? But uh, I'm gonna keep my mouth shut because I don't want to go to jail, end up in court, cemetery, uh, you know, or, or whatnot. And you don't really have to be trained to be a good fighter. I mean, there's plenty of people just who have violent intent or athletic, and they just they yeah, they're, just, they're athletic, and they got good, you know, they got a good overhand, good right overhand. <laughs> I mean, forget that. Just someone wants to grab you, stab you, and grab just, or you stab. Know, you yes, know. I mean it's it's how how close can you get to it? And a gathering is you know kind of the closest thing you know for me I, I guess. Um, yeah. Um, okay, we got a question here from John, and John is wondering any drills you guys do to train recovery. So uh, Matt, any drills you do to train recovery? Um, I mean, when I'm days that I'm not training, so my my clan trains two days a week, um, and we do TBMA drills, we spar. Um, but any day that I don't do that, I, I'm doing either a slow Carenza or a slow Sinawali by myself, things like that. I'm still, I'm still doing Kali motions, you know what I mean? But slowly, deliberately, um, same thing with footwork. Instead of you know, doing hard, hard footwork drills, I'm you know, stepping into my, my first steps you know, mm. kind of slowly flowing through the patterns that I would be using otherwise. So I, I would do the same stuff. It's just slower and, you know, a little bit more deliberate considering kind of what parts of me are, are a little bit overworked. Um, <clears throat> but um, I, I do a bit of yoga as well. So I, I highly recommend, you know, if you, um, I don't do as much. You said like, it was pretty hardcore to hot yoga for a while. Um, but I still use the poses that I learned uh, to work on whatever parts of me are not ideal. Mm. Okay. Um, same question for you, Steve. Anything you do as far as like the help with recovery? Yeah, when we go to gatherings, we try to book uh, hotels that have hot tubs. <laughs> I hear it. Hey, that's, a, that's a drill. You get in a um, hot tub and... I guess it's a good time to like to, to talk about it, right? So a Dog Brothers gathering, any style that you could think of has been represented at a gathering virtually every style. And the person might not have been a master of it, but they might've dabbled in it. Right. To fight at a gathering, you know, that's one thing it could be any style, you know, what I teach is dog brothers, martial arts. So it's completely separate. There's people who train with me that will never fight in the gathering. It's two separate things. So from the dog brothers, martial arts side, uh, one of the, the sayings is fun, fit and functional. Um, so there, there is some drills that we learn that have been like derived from like Bondo yoga on, uh, you know, stretches with like a stick and a staff. Mm. Um, they're kind of unique. Um, you know, aside from that, I mean, yeah, you just kind of have to stretch. I used to do yoga uh, a little bit more when I had more time. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it, it is important to, to kind of uh, to try to heal yourself, <laughs> but you know, nothing, nothing per se though, but that's something that is built into dog brothers, martial arts, which was kind of unique to Bondo. I was going to say that's uh, I find that really interesting that they have something like that, you know, built in as far as a curriculum like that. Um, 
I'm not saying there's not other um, curriculums that do that. I just, to be honest, up to this point, have not heard of that. But I think that's kind of neat. That oh, yeah, Dog, Dog Brothers Martial Arts, it, it came out of, uh, you know, the Jeet Kune Do environment, you know, came out of guys who were training at, you know, Dan Anosano School right, Academy. Academy. Yeah. And, um, you know, while this is a, a Filipino martial arts discussion group, I mean, Filipino martial arts is a big part of it. But we we're talking about Muay Thai before. And where did Muay Thai come from? Came from Kirby Kerbang, right? So uh, yeah. you know, there's other arts that we're, we're mixing in as well with 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 the jujitsu and what, whether it's the Brazilian style, is some Filipino influence in the grappling. You know, it's a little bit, you know, of everything. It's kind of uh, you're exposed to a lot, and you know, make it fit for you. It's, at the end of the day, it's less to fit you and work for you type of thing. It's a very yeah. kundo philosophy. Um. We got, I'm going to get a couple questions, and then I got. I want to get to uh, what the dog does mean to you guys. Uh, all right, so here we go. Um, uh, Kurt's question was, what are the no-nos that somebody new going to a gathering should probably not do or say or whatever? What would be the no-nos? <laughs> Matt. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, not major. Major. Like major major ones that are like serious, you know. Every, everyone kind of polices this is uh, nothing hard. So no um, no hard gloves, no motorcycle gloves, no red dragons, um, no uh, no Hema gear. You know nothing. Um, no extra shit on your fencing mask. Uh, no hard knee pads. No hard elbow pads. Um, if you have some medical excuse or whatever, um, you should probably just watch. That's uh, that's a big one. Um, <clears throat> the least amount of um, protective gear that you can stomach wearing is ideal. Um, I personally, I wear a cup. Um, I wear a pair of uh, combat instruments gloves, and I wear a fencing mask. Uh, most of the time, I don't even wear a mouth guard, to be honest. But uh, <clears throat> there's a little bit of padding that you can get away with if you really need it. But, um, yeah, no gloves heavier than a lacrosse glove. I mean, there's guys that wear batting gloves. Um, or, or even go no gloves. Ice dog goes no gloves sometimes. Um, so, you know, definitely uh, padding up is, is a no no. Um, yeah. If you want to do that, I think we alluded to uh, this place for you. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, yeah, like Steve sort of already touched on, um, be friends at the end of the day is one of the big, one of the big things. There are no rules. Um, you can do whatever, but, uh, there is sort of like, there is sort of an honor code. So yeah, I've definitely had my testicles hammered, uh, by <laughs> fucking Robert Koenig, who's a gigantic Hawaiian man. And he, uh, he foiled an arm bar or something that I threw in total desperation. And he like hammer fisted me all three times. Robert Koenig? Really? Yeah. Yeah, but then he asked me if I was okay, I was which was like, like the nicest like well, I, He's I, a I, very I, nice man. He was a very nice man, but I mean, we had been trying to kill each other for about 2 minutes at that point. Wow. I did everything I could to break his arm, so he was okay. Brother, he? he is a candidate dog brother. Um I want to say he's candidate something oh. I I don't want to mess it up. It's something yeah. um yeah. Polynesian. I think. Um, but yeah, 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 Robert's a very nice guy, but he's also no joke. Uh, he can, he can really fight for real. Um, that, that whole little Pacific Northwest crew up there, um, Lamont Glass and, and Jason Jones, and, uh, uh, you know, those guys are, those guys are tough. Josh, uh, I think Josh is up that way too. Josh Rogers, um, lazy eye dog. Uh, there's, yeah, there's some tough dudes up in that corner. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, that, you know, be Letting go of what happened in the fight, I guess, would be oh, that, yeah, important aftermath. there. Right, yeah, okay. Is the aftermath. I think in the, you know, like I said, I'm probably closing in on 150. Um, and I could tell you maybe three fights I'm still pissed off about. And, <laughs> well, uh, 150, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's pretty low, though. I mean, that's pretty, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and of those three fights, two of them are with the same guy. So, um, mm -hmm. You know, there's not many people I, I do not have very warm feelings for afterwards that I've fought. It's just mm. the way it is. And, 
you know, there's people that I fight every time I see a Cholo dog and I fight every time we see each other. Um, mm-hmm. We'll be fighting in the nursing home uh, <laughs> with our, like with our walkers at some point. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it's just the, the letting go, you know, do, do what you need to do. There's, there's very little in the fight um, yeah. that you would do that, you know, would be a problem. And, and uh, you know, fighting really teaches you a lot about yourself. Um, mm. You know, where you where you'll go. Uh, it teaches you where you're willing to go. I think. And and I think for most of us yeah. in that environment, you get you know you get that warrior spirit from everyone, and you realize like, where where you realize where you should go. Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah. It's yeah. not. It's almost. It's almost never a problem. I've really only seen. Um, I've only seen a couple of times where people have done something that was true that I felt was truly out of line. Um, so, and for the most part, people that do that kind of thing, uh, one of two things happens. One, they're contrite immediately. Like most people, if they hurt someone, don't feel great about it. Um, or you're in a place with about 40 people who are skilled at violence and pretty keyed up. So, and they're not happy what you just did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's yeah. it's a lot like everybody having a gun. People are pretty pretty polite. Yeah, for the yeah. Part. yeah. Uh-huh. but uh, yeah. So pat my my two big no nos would be uh, patting up. Um, just don't do it if that's what you need. Just don't do it. Go do yeah. something else okay. with yourself. Um, and then uh, the, not letting go of stuff after the fight. After the fight, right? Yeah, Which is just yeah. healthy. I mean, that's just mentally healthy. Uh, Steve, same question. What are your no nos? Yeah, I mean, a- amen to what Matt said. Um, you know, in a gathering, I-, I won't fight you if I don't like you because <laughs> then it's not going to be the essence of what a gathering is. But I never really had that situation. I mean, when guys start, I'll fight fighting, you if I don't like you. <laughs> yeah, like, that out well, there. That's I absolutely yeah, you know, that's you know. Um, cause, cause for me, if I don't like you, it's going to go someplace where it's not what I want to do in a gathering. Um, you know, but I, you know, I never really had that situation to me. It's, it really is like a family barbecue. You see like your distant relatives a couple times a year get together. We have food and everything. We just, we don't play softball or volleyball. We just do, uh, this right. And, um, you know, it, it's. You know, you got a couple of situations over the years that, you know, they get taken care of, don't come back type of thing, or it's squashed right there or, mm-hmm. or whatnot. Um, you know, the whole, listen, the whole, the whole idea is when we're fighting, if there's someone I know I could put in the hospital, I'm not going to put that person in the hospital, but I'm going to make sure that they shit in their pants throughout the fight. You know what I mean? The, you know, do like a, a nice big drop his shit in the beginning a little bit more and then a little bit more and then they come out at the end like oh, i survived that and it was pretty good it was all, oh you know and they're all excited you know because they, they know they got pushed past their limit they they functioned in the adrenal state um you know not everything worked the way that they wanted it to work but a lot did they know they'll go back and watch the fights and, and, and see what they did well what they need to work on and then when they go back and train like all of us you, you kind of like Matt was saying, you put yourself in that state. It's easy to get back into that state when you're training. So then mm. when you are doing drills that might be some broader or who but or whatever, you're thinking about it much differently than I did before I ever fought at a gathering where oh, I'm doing these tappy things and it looks great for the movies and everything. Uh, uh, you know, where now it's like, okay, I could really get into this once and then move on and, and, and whatnot. No, no, no. All right. And we got, okay. Before we get into what does mean to you, okay, questions from Roman. What age uh, do you have to be to be to get into the fold of uh, Dog Brothers? Uh, official party line is eighteen. Yes. Um, eighteen. Okay, that's like official official party line to fight in the Dog Brothers gathering. You got to be. Um, we have. A couple of 18 year olds. Um, I know uh, Mako, uh, Carrie Cardell's son, Mako. Carrie, I don't know if he's a candidate or if he's just a dog, um, but his kid uh, grew up in martial arts, um, you know, competing, 
since he was five. Uh, and we let him... We had like a kind of impromptu near like the middle of COVID gathering thing in LA. And, uh, we let Mako fight once. Um, and by that, I mean, I, I fought him because uh, I'll beat your kid for you if you don't want to. Um, anytime. Uh, <laughs> we let Mako fight. And we were like, oh, man. You know, he goes to training every single week. Uh, he trains out of it with the NoHo clan, so he's training with Dog Brothers. He's sparring with Dog Brothers. He sees it every week. His dad's one of us. So um, in that case, we did make a little bit of an exception because he was only 17. But as soon as he was 18, he was fighting gatherings. Um, places like Beat the Crap Out of Cancer are a good place to to get some reps in before um, you know before you're you know old enough to fight on your own um, in a gathering. Um, Steve's, Steve's son, Aaron, is, uh, is 12. He's been sparring with us since he was probably seven, six or seven. Yeah. That's, a, yeah. that's when you, that's when you uh, this is Sparta kicked him across the mat. <laughs> I did. I, listen, listen, uh, you loved it. I, mean, uh, I don't even feel bad about it. Not even no. a little bit. I was only kind of afraid when Alasa. No, um, and she knew it's important. It, you know, listen, it takes a tribe to raise a kid yeah, into yeah. a man, you know, so. Um, but, yeah, so 18, um, 18 is uh, is when you can fight in gatherings, yeah. Yep. Okay, and then, okay, this he's got another question. This will uh, be for you, uh, Steve. Um, what, okay, so what, how do I go about doing this, um, to get, uh, how do I go about doing this before I get 18? Like, what are the steps I should be doing? Uh, you know, it depends where you live, you know, who you're going to train with. You know, there are the beat the crap out of cancer events. Um, I'll be honest with you, even though I was fortunate to train with Nick Sekoulis, a lot of my training was just watching the VHS tapes, going through the motions. You know, this light back here behind me, when I was a kid, I probably broke it 15 times because... You know, I'm always like pulling the stick, hanging the tires outside. Listen, a big part of fighting is conditioning. Um, oh, yeah, it represents the sword. Yeah, we'll spar with aluminum trainers and treat it like a sword. But when we're fighting with the stick, it's a bludgeoning weapon, right? So you have to learn how to hit hard with power and to coordinate that with movement. So, again, it doesn't always look pretty. There's a lot of technique behind it. But when we're at a gathering, it, you know, sometimes get, gets a little loose and whatnot. But a lot of it is conditioning and, and it's, uh, you know, the drills I'll do before a gathering are very like football oriented drills. I mean, it's charging aggressive. Um, so again, I mean, if you, you know, if he's interested, he could reach out to us and we could try to see who's by him that he could train with and, and guide him. But as opposed to Matt just showing up, it's better to have someone with some experience kind of uh, guiding you a bit. Yeah. And again, you could learn from zoom through the videos uh, but at some point, really, before you're going to fight at a gathering, you really need to at least at least come and watch a gathering. Even even before I fought at my first gathering, I went and watched. Look, yeah. what's the vibe? And I already was exposed to a lot of it. I was fortunate. Come and watch. You know, that's that's a good first step. See if you're really interested in it. See what the people mm -hmm. are like. Um, okay. It's you know, you know, yeah. California, uh, Canada. You know, there's a lot of beat the crap out of cancer events. Uh, you, know, sh you know, Chicago has it, New York, you know, where, you know, where, there's a yeah. bunch of places. So if you reach out to us, we could try to set you up with the right person. Right. And we're going to do something. We're going to do something uh, fairly good size. I was actually talking to Beowulf a little bit today. Um, well, he, he texted me. I didn't respond back. Yet. Very, very much looking but, forward to um, seeing you again. <laughs> I'm good. very, I'm very excited for him being in the Northeast now, too. Um, we really have some actual you know good guys up here now it's been a it, there's a period of time where it was sort of a wasteland uh when i was coming up there's nobody in the northeast at all so i mean i had green mountain dog i guess and, and cyborg dog was around a little bit but he was on his way out um at that point he was kind of retiring so um we're gonna in either late june or early july depending on um how it works out we're gonna have like a a big East Coast sparring day. Um, it looks like Canada's not doing their event until August again this year. 
Uh, I spoke to Ice Dog today. It's not official or anything like that. What it, when exactly it's going to be? But he gave me a date, and I was like, "That's a month out from the from the open gathering in in um, in L.A." So I mean, if you can't make it to L.A. at all, yeah, having Montreal is fine. But I mean, the, the sort of mecca of the whole thing is that it's, it's LA. a yeah. big gathering in L.A. So it doesn't really make sense to do that. But I'm not in charge of Canada, so. They'll do what they want, I guess. But um, when uh, when we get together in July, that's a great time, uh, or you know, June, July, whatever it is. That's a great time to get some experience. You know, uh, spar as much as you can. Like Steve said, conditioning um, and sport specific conditioning is is really helpful. So I mean, doing ladder drills with your collie footwork, do um, you know, getting a tire and just practicing your power shots. You know, even just like two, three strike combinations, like, you know, number one to back end horizontal. Um, if you can throw that really hard, you've got uh, an edge on anybody who's just been doing tippy tappy drills. Yeah, um, right. Who's just a dog yeah. brothers fight, you know, just twirling your stick around a lot and, and um, having the ability to weave your hands really fast is, is cool, but it means nothing when someone is swinging an inch and a quarter. Um, diameter rattan at you. Yeah, 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 for sure. And they've been hitting with power. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I can split a heavy bag in fairly short order with a with a stick, and I'm not very big. Um, that's why we train with tires. Uh, there's mm. guys who, you, you'll, you can see if you look around on Instagram, especially like the European guys have some pretty cool training tools. They, um, they're not the only ones that do it now, but I know Steve's probably got a bunch of them. But they uh, they started cutting sections out of tires and putting handles on them. So instead of having to hold a whole tire, someone can hold the, the shield. You know what I mean? It's got like two two grips, and they can hit the, the section of the tire, and then you can switch off. That's not how – Green Mountain Dog used to literally like – he would uh, – he would hold the tire and run backwards and I'd have to run forward and hit the tire and do Sinawali and then we'd switch and I'd hold the tire and run backwards and he'd hit the tire and do Sinawali. So, mm. um, I mean, it's not a bad thing. Uh, I think when we were, do we're doing the, um, the dry run yesterday, Steve was talking about the top dog style of tire workouts where, you know, you throw the tire and then run out there and swing your stick and then throw the tire and run after it mm. or, uh, you know, picking it up and slamming it. I mean, if you've just got a tire, you can do a, you can do a lot with it. Um, especially, you know, in, in terms of Kali specific workouts, just doing like, uh, start with the tire down low and lift it up over your shoulder real fast a bunch of times, so both sides, um, you know, works on your grip strength cause you're not throwing it, you know, you're not losing it, but you're coming from, you know, the angles mm. that you've used building those core muscles, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, oh, Brett, Brett was saying something. Brett Reese, uh, Kentucky, I think. Is Jake Olson from Kentucky? I don't know where Jake is from. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. He, I, I think he's somewhere in might be. that neck of the woods. But, yeah, try to sync up through uh, through Dean, and I'll see. we'll see if we could, you know, if you're interested, if that's who was asking. Um, mm, yeah. So yeah, whoever's interested, just you know, get you know through Dean, reach out to us, and um, we'll see who we can set you up with to train train with. Yeah, there's people all over the world. So, okay. Um, all right, here's um, okay. So before we get into DBMA and how to uh, get the word out about you guys as far as growth, what um, as far as the dog brothers ethos and brotherhood, what um, how significant has the in, impact been on uh, each of you, and why is it unique? So whoever wants to go first. Um, I would say the dog brothers experience and the you know brother slash sisterhood because there's a bunch of women as well um, that has come from it and the friendships that I've developed um, in this last decade and some change uh, are going to last the rest of my life. Um, mm. you know, 
in a in a really profound way that I, you know, when I got on an airplane to fight some guy from the internet, uh, I didn't realize what I was getting into. Um, I didn't understand yet, and it's something that it took me a minute. Um, I've tried to explain to to people, either family members or significant others or whatever, over the years, um, what was going on when I when I go to these crazy fighting events on the other side of the country or in another country or whatever. And uh, a lot of the times people don't get it until they go in person. Like my sister came to Montreal one time and uh, she said afterwards, she goes, you know, I didn't get this before. She's like, I didn't understand. She's like, I, I think it was like, uh, it was my birthday weekend or something. So we were going to hang out and party for a little bit in Montreal anyway. And she was like, I just came up here to have fun and, it's, you know, you happen to be doing this thing today. Um, it's like, but I really get it. I saw what it was like um, for you and, and what, you know, Steve's um, analogy of a family barbecue. Uh, I, I don't always look at it like that. Um, for me, the, the fighting is a lot of what it's about. Um, and the other stuff is a, it's a happy byproduct that came with it. Um, I have issues i assume so that is why the fighting is the most important part for me but really close second to the fighting is the relationships with people mm. um the entirety of uh what dog brothers brings to the table resonated with me you know um the the um all the cliche sayings, the higher consciousness through harder contact and the adventure continues and the greater the dichotomy, the profounder the transformation, all those things that, you know, are part of, uh, like Steve calls it, the Kool-Aid. Um, you know, walk as a warrior for all your days. Um, I think they're the nice oh, cliches. That's a myth, you know. <laughs> there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. There's a few more. Um, but, uh, oh, there's... Some of them are off color these days. They'll get, they'll get us canceled. But um, there's 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 been a lot that has come to my life um, mm. through being a part of the Dog Brothers, and uh, I don't know where I would be or what would be going on for me right now. But I don't be um, as positive as my life is now. So yeah, no, not I definitely. Fair. I owe the organization my, you know. As a as an entity, uh, quite a bit, I think. Okay. Yeah. Uh, same question for you, Steve. Yeah. No. I mean, it's uh, been life changing for me. Um, if I if I wasn't doing this, uh, I'm not kidding. I would have already thrown someone off of a very tall building in Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. The com camaraderie's there. I mean. You know, it's interesting when you go to a gathering, it's uh, like, you know, the early Star Wars movies, or the, the Star Wars bar, where it's all these different kind of creatures. I love this analogy, man. And there, there, there's people from every type of walk in life, oh, you know, religious that. belief, political belief. But when we get together for light, for fighting, it's we leave all that at the sidelines. We're just mm -hmm. there to help sharpen steel with each other, to help us make each other better as a tribe. Yeah. Uh, you know, I guess it's a little bit cliche, but, you know, we're a pack of dogs. You know, we're going to fight hard enough that we're all going to benefit from it and learn from it. Mm. There's no ranking per se, but through the fighting, we all know where we sit. You know, you know, we're humble about it, but we're challenging ourselves. It's like, wow, I know I'm here now. I want to fight that guy. You know, mm. in two years, I want to fight him. And that's how you're gauging yourself. You know, yeah. we're not sharing videos you know on the internet because we, you know we don't want to make it look like oh, i kicked this guy's ass and diminish from what it is it's a learning experience for us um for me i'm going to be doing this into my 60s i'm going to be fight there's guys now still fighting into their 60s tremendous in inspiration if i was just doing regular kind of competitive fighting you know my late 20s i would have been done because pretty much you're kind of over the hill when you're Hitting 30 as a as yeah, when a, you're in your 30s, right? I'm that fighter, but this is something you know, I'm gonna keep going doing it, and uh, you know, it's kind of a way of life for me. It's it's great to share it with my son, uh, it's great to share it with other people, just help them become more confident and 
mm -hmm. you know, the bonds that are built and, you know, just to touch more on the slogans Matt was, was talking about earlier from the dog brothers, martial arts side of things. Yeah. Like fun, fit and functional walk as a warrior for all your days. Um, you know, there are others then, you know, from the dog brothers, the fighting side, which doesn't really have everything to do, you know, it could be anyone it doesn't have to be dog brothers, martial arts. Uh, yeah. Higher consciousness through harder contact. I mean, it's a, it's a big thing. Like when you're going out there to fight, it's, yeah, you're going out with your team, everyone who you train with over your years. But when you're stepping out there, it's you versus that other person. Yeah, sometimes you have two on one fights and whatnot, whatever. Uh, but you're bringing all that with you. So the the, the bigger, the, the longer uh, slogan that Matt was was talking about is, you know, the greater the dichotomy, the profounder the transformation, higher consciousness through harder contact. So what that means is the the deeper you put yourself into that adrenal chaotic experience of a fight but you're able to stay grounded where it actually feels like you're just playing and you can have ethical control over all right that guy's mask came off i'm not going to hit him in the head i'm going to go for a hand shot i'm going to clinch i'm going to take him down instead and keep the fight going that way uh is tremendous and then there's times in fights where i would think x y and z happened until i watch the video and it's like whoa that's not what happened and it's a little controversial what I'm about to say, but I think a lot of people out there, you know, in law enforcement don't have enough adrenalized training and the level of adrenal response they need to have, you know, in a gathering, I know no one's really going to kill me, but, you know, law enforcement, someone could get killed out there and not having the adrenal. That's a fair statement. Yeah. Not having that adrenal uh, training is, I think, a huge detriment. In my opinion, well, I'll say it. Ninety-nine point nine five percent of cops are out of shape and couldn't fight their way out of a wet paper bag. Yeah, and, and the training that they've gotten, you know, minimal. So to me, no, the training I'd like to see more. I'd like to see more law enforcement do that. But you know, especially how sensitive the world is now, people looking from the outside are going to see a complete. Oh, they're, they're training cops to do this and all yeah. that. In their defense, funding the funding is a nightmare. The whole funding is that, and then of course. You know, are they taking it upon themselves to improve their their you know their self uh, based on self reliance and making a better version of himself on the job? No. <laughs> no, but they should. That's the part that I look down on. Like yeah, you, you, know? you go, you put yourself in that position every day, and it's not paramount to you. Absolutely yeah. paramount to be physically capable. Your prior priorities are no, fucked. No, I mean, like, right, whatever, right. whatever other excuses I've heard guys say talk about their know what they have for free time how much money they have mm, no that's not no. that's not enough of an excuse i, I don't think if oh, you're, no, I'm not uh, with a violence you. if you're in a violence profession um and you don't train for violence outside of what your work pays for mm. you're sad pathetic no I, I i totally agree with you guys i mean right you should be taking upon yourself your personal job vocation journey to be the best version of you and especially on a job like that if you're not doing that then you're making yourself susceptible to getting hurt on the job you know, I mean? then, you know just to go in a different in a different you know direction i think what what the dog brothers have offered especially when it was developed in the 80s at that time there wasn't much you you know you had played in press as videos vhs tapes you had black belt magazine kung fu magazine and the yellow pages and kung yeah. fu flicks and, and danny larusso and you know back to oh dim mock i'm gonna kill you with this oh i had 20 million street fights i'm an ex-marine a prisoner you know great you know it was very segmented a lot of ego involved so for it to develop at that time where everyone got together from all these different systems and kind of hashed it out but was were, were cool and realized there was more in common than, than different uh i think that was pretty impressive for for, for that time and then if you continue on, you know, especially how sensitive our world has, has gotten that we're still doing this in the same respect. I mean, the, 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 you know, our country is so divided right now. Yeah. But when we get together at gatherings, it's you feel none of it. And, and oh, yeah, sure right, everyone right. has completely opposite spectrum of views. But everyone's really cool. I mean, it really is, to me, a family barbecue. And everyone, for the most part, yeah, whatever. You know, you get a lot of alphas in, in a room. You know, the things... Don't always work out perfectly, but you, you figure out ways to make them work out <laughs> like in any family. But, you know, for the most part, it's a it's a really it's a really pure experience. You know, it's it's um, yeah. without it, I'd, be, I'd really be lost, to be honest with you. 
No, that's no, no, no. I'm feeling it. I'm hearing it. For me, listen, I, I know there's a lot of egos out there and this style and that style, whatever. Just show up. Just come to a gathering. You know, you don't have to fight. Don't feel like, oh, you know, if I go, I'm going to look stupid in front of my students. Just come. Just just hang out. Just meet some of the people. Talk to them. And then, you know, maybe you'll be willing to try it then type of thing. You know, and I think it's yeah. a, just, just to break the ice. You know what I mean? We're all we're all good guys. It's not about cockiness, ego. Like I said, you name the system or style, I'll pull up a, a Rolodex of someone who's trained in it before. Yeah, you know, who's been there. You know, yeah, that, yeah. that represented stepping out on the field. Yeah, I'm going to get into that, like how to entice more folks to come and check it out. But, D, okay, so um, DBMA, and uh, I want to get to uh, Danny's question that he submitted yesterday during the test run. And his question was, what makes DBMA different from other FMA styles? Is it the curriculum, the philosophy, et cetera? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, <laughs> like, I, like I said yesterday, I would say um, it's, a, it's a combination of a few things. Number one, um, DBMA has a lot more of uh, the Bruce Lee, Jeet Kune Do kind of mindset than most Kali uh, or most FMA that I've been exposed to, where um, the idea of taking what is useful, discarding what is useless, and adding what is essentially yours is mostly how it, how it came about. Um, DBMA is distilled from a bunch of systems. Steve and I both come from, you know, our base systems are, are some of the base systems. Um, Inostanto Blend, Pikiti Tertia, Lumeco. Um, I know those are some of the things that were brought in at the beginning. There's Privy Cravat, mm. there's um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, there's some wrestling, there's some Silat. You know, it's a system of many styles. So um, there's there's a constant evolution to DBMA. Like the first DBMA that I was exposed to uh, when I trained with Cyborg Dog a few times looked different from what I trained for years uh, with Joe Dix. And then that looks a little different from, um, you know, some of the stuff that has been coming out more lately. And then uh, Lonely Dog has his whole entire own variation of DBMA. So mm. um, the like, what is DB, uh, what is DBMA um, already starts to set it apart just in general. And then in terms of the actual training, um, the drills are set up a lot closer to how you would train either for a, a, a contact sport or for MMA. Um, where it's a lot less, um, it's a lot less of the the long pattern drills and disarms and the you know the flowery stuff. Um, <clears throat> honestly, I I think uh, a lot of that stuff that's taught in American FMA schools is just taught to keep giving people new stuff to keep learning. You know what I mean? You you got to keep that revenue coming in. You got to keep you know, people engaged, and um, if they're not actually fighting with it, you, you have to constantly be giving sort of novel, mm. complicated things, flowery stuff. But most of that stuff doesn't work uh, outside of very small circumstances. You know what I mean? All mm. that um, kind of trapping range stuff, all, all those close in disarms, like, you have an instant maybe in a fight where if you get lucky enough to survive, to get that close, you might be able to pull something like that off. But, you know, the amount of time that some schools spend on it, um, it's mm -hmm. just, you know, like I said, it keeps people engaged, but um, I've been to FMA schools in this area. Um, and honestly, it's, I, I don't train in them because I don't see a lot of, uh, a lot of crossover with what I do. Um, I learned Pikiti Tertia from someone that was already a dog brother. So the way that Pikiti was presented to me and the way that um, we trained was already geared towards full contact stick fighting more than towards, um, you know, some of the, some of the other things that those guys are focused on, uh, like uh, LARPing special forces. Uh, sorry. I didn't say that out loud today. Um, I think that, 
the Dog Brothers style drilling and the range the range control um, that we're thinking about all the time is probably the best way that I've run across to, to train for a full context in fighting. Mean, that's why I do it. Um, the other aspect of PPMA that's really important is um, if you see it taught, you see it fought. When you, you know, I've watched hours and hours and hours of Dog Brother DVD. Um, I've pulled tons of material out of them to train myself or train with other people. And uh, one thing that, you know, you will get when you see those DVDs is you will see people pulling these moves off these combinations, these concepts, like the conceptual stuff. If you don't understand um, how to read your opponent's structure and you just put, like, <clears throat> Sinawali is something. Do I have? Of course they just um, I know. Of, I was, of course I, I was like waiting for this. Prowling dog. <laughs> of course you did. Um, Sinawali is not just. A, a pattern drill, you know what I mean? Like you can, right. you can hit a guy three times with one, two, three, right? But you can't do it if you don't know what direction you need to move, what you're actually aiming at, right. and you know when to when to to throw that combination. And it's all based off of reading your opponent's structure, and that's something that is a big part of the way that um, you know DBMA is disseminated. Is like okay. If, I, if my opponent has um, his front stick uh, at, at, you know, this angle or, or steeper or uh, shallower, rather, going that direction, I'm going to do one thing. If his stick is, oh, sorry, if his stick is here, uh, I'm going to do a completely different thing. Because if I try and pull off my move for the stick being on this side, when it's on that side, uh, I'm not going to have the angles correct and I'm going to mm. rattan. So it, it all comes from a lot of uh, hard, hard fought experience, and um, I think that that's not something that most styles have anymore. I think a lot of it is just uh, so. Yeah, no, 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 no. So um, we have a couple of questions regarding this, but I want to get Steve's uh, take on here. May, actually, you know what, Steve? Maybe you can tie this into your explanation of DBMA and. Um, uh, the question from Danny is, are there many art drills versus fight drills? So within the respects of DBMA, Steve, and plus your your take on uh, DBMA since you're an instructor. Yeah, I mean, it's the same as Matt's saying. You, you, you see it taught, you see it fought. You know, that, that was a, a big thing for me. Um, primal probabilities first. You know, the first, very first VHS tape, power. <laughs> like it's it's a bludgeoning weapon if you're not developing the power then you know again it's not so much a curriculum it was more the material was like kind of released in like kind of blocks and segments okay. um you know then I, I think the next big thing for me that kind of differentiated my my i know sano blend training into fighting um was the the concept of attacking blocks that was a very huge concept for me and I still develop variations of it to this day of like, oh, I didn't think I could do it like this. So it's kind of you'll learn certain techniques and it's like, all right, we'll figure out how to use the same concept in, in your own mind. Um, combining stick and footwork is huge. You know, to be able to just sit there and, and whip a stick around is great. I take three steps back and I look at you. It's like, all right, I'm over here, you know. Uh, so for, for someone to be able to, you know, the, the speed of the fight is the speed of your feet. So if you're not coordinated with stepping and simultaneously hitting and simultaneously blocking with each step, you're not going to be such a functional fighter as you think you are when you're just blazing on a bag. Um, so the ability to be able to run full speed while stick fighting took me many years. That's kind of the essence of what we're going for. Um, I'm not saying other styles don't teach it. It's just you're not really practicing it or understanding why you need to do that. Um, but then, you know, you know, dog brothers, martial arts, yeah, we're blending our own and there's different variations, how, how crafty teaches lonely. And, you know, there's so many influences from, from, you know, top dog and salty dog and sled dog and, and everyone, everyone brings their own piece into it. But I, what, what I found the most interesting, maybe five, I don't know, I'm bad with, with dates, maybe five, six years ago, 
mime dog came and, and visited from Germany. And he came down, we hung out, we're sparring with the group. And after we sparred, we're both like, holy shit, you're all the way across the fucking pond. But it's like fighting a mirror. <laughs> There's certain things that just inherently look like dog brothers martial arts nothing different than anyone else does mm. and it's not even dog brothers martial arts and maybe it's just the dog brothers style of fighting um but you know very much so where dog brothers martial arts came from is to prepare people for these gatherings so it's like all right and then it, then it became kind of fun for people it's like all right let's develop this technique and see how it works and you know what i might pull off successfully against like guy a and b it's like all right now do it against him <laughs> so how do you actually make that work against that guy you know type right. of thing. no it's interesting matter of fact renee's got an interesting comment here um and his comment is the material was coming from mark that analyzed thousands of fight concentrate the information and functional system kind of like what piper did. i mean piper's heavily tactic based so I think what Renee's alluding to is that, you know, he, he looked, examined what was working, much like the old Guardians in Cape Town. They would see what was developing and from a tactic point of view and like what came out a lot. And then hence, well, this is kind of what got put into as far as the tactics, as far as the system, heavily tactic base, uh, which I'm sure FMA was at one time year, long, long time ago before it got, you know, codified and over systematized and and uh far syllabus but yeah so i think he may, raises an interesting point there um i think also what, what what's unique about dog brothers martial arts a lot of the styles i've trained in previously were like you know largo medio corto range mm. and those ranges happen very quickly in the fight you're staying <laughs> in largo range you're both getting smashed great you got balls you got heart you know, but at the end of the day, you want to be an intelligent fighter too. Uh, you know, if we're fighting without a mask, um, you know, as much as you know, certain shots with the mask will ring your bell. You still have some protection, right? So, Dog Brothers Martial Arts, we we define it as seven ranges. There's the Snake Range, where it's kind of like that psychological range, where that's where you know you're doing the stick twirling and your your, your sticks in motion, so that when you're actually going to swing the shot. It doesn't look like you're just loading out and, and chambering mm. it's out of the motion. Your hand's moving, so it's not a target. Um, you know, it's 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 more deceptive where it's coming. You're doing your fates and you're faking and you're trying to gauge the person. Then when the weapons collide, when you're really swinging out there with with heavier weapons, denser weapons that could do a lot of damage, like you saw Matt's you know hand. Um, when those weapons collide, to get past that weapon rain intelligently. Is difficult, but when you're going to fight in the street against just some guy who's pissed off with a with a piece of rebar or a baseball bat, you got to deal with that primal probability first. Because you showed the video in the beginning, you see the ape, which will offend people, right? <laughs> Swinging the you know the 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 the, the bone and whatnot. Yeah. Anyone could pick up a weapon and just swing it like a beast. One hundred percent. How do you get past that? How do you intelligently get to the Largo Medio Corto range from there? Right. It takes a lot to deal with that, to, to safely get in and get out yeah. at your will. So then, you know, after those those ranges, then you have the standing clinch, which is different because now you have a weapon involved. We also will have hidden knives on us, training knives that will pull out. Yeah. And it's great. There's a lot. I'm not knocking any of the, the knife systems out there, but I give my daughter when she was five a lipstick and I could spar with her and I'm going to have lipstick all over me. You know what I mean? No, give them a magic marker. But, but how do you actually take out your weapon? You know, most of us are just, you know, as an everyday carrier carrying maybe a folder. How do you actually get that out in a fight where in the fight, well, like when we're in a gathering, it's like, oh, that's not the first thing I'm going to get to. But if I'm going to take out my knife and a weapon, it's kind of, I'm, um, psychologically getting myself ready like okay this is really the kind of fight where my family's behind me they're not stopping there's more people and i have to potentially take a life to save a life right it's not like i'm gonna go out there looking to kill someone right so when we do train this at a gathering it's with that mindset and i actually have to take out the folder articulate opening it when you're in complete adrenal stress load that's something that a lot of knife systems don't have a drill to fully train right Drawing um, under pressure. Yeah. Imagine that. 
that, that, that's a bigger skill, right? I mean, once it's out, you don't really. I need give my students that. I can find out. Not at any knife system, but if you can't wrong. take it out and hold on to it, yeah. And no, it's a very it's it's right. Right and actually know when to pull it out. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. No, no, no. One hundred percent. I mean, drawing under pressure. Uh, I don't care how many knives I have. If you have, if you're not practicing drawing under pressure. I don't, but that's a big difference that you know a lot of a lot of styles do not want to go to the ground right um i know there have been times where whatever it is these are the rules but you know guess what in a fight it's gonna you know a lot of times it's gonna go to the ground so you need to know what to, to do there uh it's a different game when weapons are involved on the on the ground you know something that is acceptable mm -hmm. to do in submission grappling is going to get you into a lot of trouble when sticks are involved and vice versa right mm -hmm. um yeah i mean it's it, at the end of the day though we can only flail our arms and legs in so many different ways mm -hmm. so you know when i when i when i fight with people it's like oh wow i never trained dbma it's like well you just did <laughs> you just, you just, you just experienced it. so i didn't train your system yeah and guess what a lot of it's very similar at the end of the day because yeah. even if you're learning these different things from the system what actually comes out at, at a gathering is is a shortened condensed version of what you know so it's it's actually making all that stuff work and again I did it against guy A and B, and again, no ranking system, but it's like, okay, now make it work against him. Mm. Now do that in a two-on-one fight, you know? So to me, it's, I'd rather know less and less, just white belt level techniques uh, at a black belt level of understanding. And there have been comments over the years, oh, you watch the fight, you guys just look like a bunch of psychopaths swinging sticks, there's no technique. One, come train with me, <laughs> and I'll put you to sleep discussing like the intricacies of the technical details of the most basic move but yeah when i go out and fight it's raw savage it's it's not you know there's an art side to it and there's the martial side to it right mm -hmm. so if I'm doing Carenza, yeah my Carenza looks different especially <laughs> during uh covid when we're locked up and all pent up it's like you know a lot of people have <laughs> nice flowing and i can have nice flowing Carenza, but you know you could see the intent behind my Carenza. you know what i mean it's like oh i got a lot of pent up and you know i'm working out uh that in my carenza because why I, I fight a lot so you know it's, it's putting yourself back in that state so dbma is no different than anything else it's no better than anything else yeah. it's just an open-minded way of, of looking at the jkd philosophy um again it's different not everyone who trains dbma fights at gatherings or vice versa um but what i ask you guys you know there's uh, keyboard warriors this and that people ego my style is the best this and that just come to a gathering just come introduce yourself you know i think nick's done a great job with serata you know every uh filipino yeah. system has their their, their uh, politics and whatnot and you know serata has it right i think nick's oh, yeah. been doing a really good job of kind of training mm. with a lot of different people and getting their their respect um and it's like uh he's out there doing it right oh, yeah, so six inch sticks which i need to do at a gathering i haven't done yet so uh it was nick remind me to fight this in may with some 26 but uh but i mean you know, he got other guys from serata to come and fight too no, uh, you know vincent cabalas came down it was awesome and he was very surprised like oh wow like you know like these guys are really honorable respectful guys cool guys and they're helping my student out giving them suggestions it's not like you know we're trying mm. to like steal anyone's students just like hey listen in general try to do this this that and this and avoid this this is what you know you're getting thrown into this now you know so i think it's been a very you know positive experience and i'd like to see that for, from other systems and styles yeah obviously there's a lot of systems and styles represented mm -hmm. but i think there's a lot of people that have a lot of ego and not not in a bad way. Egos to protect yourself, right? I mean, it's you know it doesn't. Yeah, matter. I think healthy ego is. Yeah, healthy yeah. ego, right? You don't want to look stupid in front of your students. Not yeah. there's no trophies, no referees, there's no judging. Come yeah. down, watch a gathering. That's that's what I like to see more. You know, just people. No, we're gonna, and we're gonna, that's something we're gonna But hey, Steve, Renee is actually saying there is eight ranges, 
And the eighth range is, <laughs> is Steve Sachs. I only, I only teach it privately. <laughs> what is it? What's the eighth range? Uh, the eighth range is, <laughs> there's the eighth range Steve Sachs. <laughs> and I only teach that privately. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, there's the stinky stick techniques and all that. And, you know, I guess you could do stuff at further distances as well than, than snake range, I suppose. Super important to know when the, oh my God, this guy. <laughs> he's freaking. Yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, um, there's times, there's times, and there's some people on the chat over here where I'm just they trying got to get triangle and the stinky here. stick did not work. Yeah. So, yeah, I can't. I can't see the chat from my my browser right, here. So we'll so do, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm just catching up on a comment. So right here well, is one, uh, one last thing that uh, that I'll, I'll say about DBMA, and, and again, okay, not, not different than a style, but I think a big thing I learned from DBMA, and and the variety of fighters that I fought with, and the amount of analysis that has been go gone on through the videos that you learn from, is to be able to recognize different fighting structures to be able to emulate them and to flow between the different fighting structures and to know how to match up different, you know, fighting structures. You know, it's not the man that you're beating, it's the style. So I think that's a very important thing because, Hey, that didn't work. Yeah. Well, why would you try that against when he's doing this? Of course it's not going to work. Yeah. <laughs> and again, who you're fighting. Right. So I think that's, that's a, that's a huge thing as well. Um, Okay, I'm just catching up on a comment. So we got one in here. Nick was saying, uh, nobody in DBS suggested I give up the abandon my style. They only help me with development more effectively. Okay. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that never, John Kleiman, that never would have happened. Okay. So I was asking, like, what happens on the ground, right? So the analogy when you're fighting on the ground uh, that Crafty uses, like, uh, stick grappling is like, playing um, pinball with three balls at one time so yeah like you, you have your your straight up submission wrestling skills you mm -hmm. have you know your mma type grappling skills and now you have a weapon involved as well which you could choke with and hit and it's just yeah. it's, like keeping, it's like juggling those three balls at one time and again you could pull out folding knives and, and whatnot yeah. um and again what i was saying before like one what what's all right, for example, you know, I have to turn in my blue belt again, you know, my a Henzo blue belt. I turned it in a couple of times. Oh, no. But, you know, going against a, a purple belt and, and just straight up no gi, going for a triangle choke as a, uh, a, you know, an okay blue belt going against a solid purple belt, I'm not pulling off a triangle choke. But then sometimes it's like, hey, let's play with the stick. And then they're completely ignoring the stick. It's like, you see how I'm like kind of tapping you on your knee there? Imagine I'm really doing And then, you know, they start, you know, and then we start playing. They start respecting yeah. the stick. And it's like, oh, okay, boom, 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 triangle choke. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because they're chasing the tri the stick. They don't want to get hit. So I think, you know, understanding how that all fits together and knowing, like, the, the different disciplines and, and rule sets individually, and you get out on the field, um, there's a lot more There's a lot more to it. There's a lot of, you know, again, oh, it looks barbaric. It's actually a lot – a lot of mine that goes into it so it is oh different. no i mean yeah i know i i could definitely see that there was a lot of thought yeah 100 that was put into that what he created in dbma i mean that yeah 100 i mean I, I think he's genius like in, to be honest with you um in some regards mark denny i i do i think what he has made there in that program what i've witnessed and seen and um his cliches you know, I, I think there's something there's something special going on there. Yeah, and there's, there's so many people who, who contributed to it, and then yeah. you know, just taking our founding fathers, you know, Mark and Arlen and Eric, and, and I, you know, I'm leaving everyone out, but those are the, the three founders. I mean, for them to pave the way for what we're doing now, it was immense. I mean, it's not something you could just do and and have. So no. for us to have the ability to do this now, it means a lot to me. It really does, and. For me, I want to keep it alive and growing, and it's great. Yeah. Your son's involved, my son's involved, and there are some younger people getting involved. But definitely want more people to show up, you know, from different systems. That's how we all get better. And actually, that's what I want to go into now is um, how do we? So basically, um, like I told you guys in the test run, like I'm like fully so supportive of you guys, uh, not just for my son, but just 
I just think you guys are great guys. There's no ego. I think it's such a breath of fresh air. There's no know-it-alls or trying to, you know, impart, you know, over, like uh, obnoxiously. I mean, I thought it was a very helpful hint, you know, helpful suggestions and, and all that, which is obviously is fantastic. Um, but how do we, uh, besides beat the crap out of cancer and all that, um, how, you know, this would be for both of you. So, Matt, how do we, um, you know, knowing that we not get you guys want to get more involved, but also though, you also want to, um, you just don't want just anybody. I mean, there's, a, I, if I'm not mistaken, there's kind of a certain, certain type of pedigree or person or fighter or not. I shouldn't say fighters, but people that you're looking for, you know, that you want part of this. Yeah. So I think uh, something I said last night um, was that uh, this kind of thing. Dark, whether it's dog brothers or, or just, you know, actually testing your martial art in general, uh, it's for anyone, but it's not for everyone. So there's not one quote unquote type of person we're looking for uh, on the outside. You know what I mean? There's no one art that we're like, well, if you do this, you just be a natural for dog brothers. It doesn't really work that way. Um, there's an intangibility that uh, people who are willing to, to fight um, have, whether it's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, kickboxing, MMA, you know, Dog Brothers boxing. Um, I don't count grappling. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I don't count BJJ in general as like, oh, competitors or everybody who does it. Mm -hmm. uh, is automatically kind of a badass because it's pretty consequence free comparatively. Um, a lot of people I think do BJJ cause they don't like being hit. Um, and they want to say they do a martial art. Um, BJJ is cerebral, but it's easy in like comparison. Um, I'm not, I don't, I'm not trying like I train Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, so I'm not mm. like, shitting on the art, but, um, I think a lot of people that train it do it, uh, because it's, it's, less uncomfortable um, than other arts. And I think a lot of people that do FMA don't actually spar because it's less uncomfortable to not um, get hit and to not have a physical consequence. But, uh, you know, those people that are willing to deal with the physical consequence are the kind of people mm. um, <clears throat> I'm, You know, as much as I don't want to scare anyone off that's, like, on the fence, I think if you're on the fence, do it. Try it. You know, if you don't like it, it stops as soon as you drop your stick and let out a squeal. Like, mm. you know, you can quit any time. Like, we're, I'm not going to keep beating you for the full two minutes. <laughs> I, I only did that – I did that one time to Michael Underdown, but he, he – it was all right. Um, he, had asked, he had asked me to, to bring him um, a bottle of mead. There's a meadery uh, near my house, and um, I throw – I basically do it every year. I bring a bottle um, for the gathering and after the gathering, I pass it around. Um, he had, had had a sip the year before and he had said, oh man, you got to bring me a bottle of that. I was like, yeah, man, no problem. And I got there and uh, he goes, oh, what do I owe you for the mead? And I started laughing. I go, <laughs> there will be no money. It was like the Dalai Lama in Caddyshack, you know, when, uh, when Carl was like, hey, Lama. How about a little yeah. uh, something for the trouble? And the Don <laughs> Lama goes, oh, there will be no money. Uh, but on your deathbed, you will achieve total consciousness. So I got that going for me. Oh, um, I, I was like, oh, there will, there will be no money. Um, I'm going to beat you with a stick for two minutes. And like, I'm not going to stop. I told him, I go, I'm not going to stop it. Because I, I mean, like, if you see me fight, I, I, depending on the situation, I'll usually eventually close the grapple and, and finish the fight. Um, from from either uh, a knife or you know a mount or, or something else. Like I, I like to use all my skill if I can in a fight. Um, mm. But uh, and and that day I had had a couple of fights that I ended on the ground, and I think he thought that that was what was going to happen, and uh, I just refused. It was just <laughs> I just kept it going. But uh, you know he got a pretty sweet bottle of meat out of it. So I yeah, think that yeah, that was a mutual. Uh... You know it was a good trade. I got to indulge in a little bit of sadism, and he got to, you know, uh, drink to soothe the bru uh, the bruises later. Jeez, that is something. Um, uh, but, you know, like, 
not like I said, not not to try and scare off the um, people that are on the fence, but um, you know, uh, whatever you think Fight Club was about, I know people all think it's about something different. Um, the line, "How much can you know about yourself if you've never been in a fight?" Uh, that 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 resonates to me uh, a lot, actually. Uh, I've learned more about myself through fighting. I think. Okay, no, I mean, before we turn it over to Steve, the same question. Um, I think, you know, I'm, again, I'm trying to get, you know, definitely uh, grow the interest and all that for a number of reasons. Uh, one, you know, to uh, just experience it, be around these folks and give it a chance. You're going to find them really a breath of fresh air. Uh, I didn't meet one arrogant a person that I didn't want to be around with. I mean, you guys, John Kleinman, I think he's a, he's a super guy too, right? Nick Merchant. Um, who else is there? Uh, 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 Scott, uh, Scott, your guy Scott there. I thought Angry was Scott, there. yeah. Angry uh, Scott's a good guy. Yep. Yeah, I mean, who's Chris, and, uh, Steve Chris, right? Uh, uh, Cheat Dog, right? I mean, he's, I mean, nothing but... Yeah. Candidate. Yeah, just good yeah. guys, man, that are just not looking just because you're new and they're, you know, and they just want to, you know, all their hammer. No, I mean, they're, uh, it's, it's not like that. It's not like that at all. You know what I mean? It's, um, they're like actually so thrilled. I found anyway, they were so thrilled that people came, he showed up and they're like, hey, thanks for coming. Like, thanks for, you know, supporting this. Thanks for, you know, jumping in. Thanks for trying this out. It was nothing but stuff like that. Um, no, but Steve, I want to hand it over to you. Yeah, so, no, listen, we, we appreciate what you do, Dean. One, I mean, it's for the whole Filipino martial arts community for you to have this many episodes to document systems mm. that might unfortunately die out. You know what I mean? At least you're preserving it and getting it out there. So, you know, helping, helping, uh, use your platform to, to help us promote and kind of spread the word is, is big. Um, Something else, you know, you know, Matt and I, listen, we, you know, m most of the gatherings have been in California, yeah, Canada. Um, but, you know, a lot of the time we were, we were flying out from the East Coast to California and it's expensive. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've been out there, but not everyone's willing to do that. So to have a traveling open gathering uh, has been talked about a lot. It's been tried a couple of times before uh, COVID. It was just always something that came up. <laughs> yeah. I still think it's something that 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 should happen, um, but it, rightfully so. They, like a lot of these places still have sparring days mm. and, and beat the crap out of cancer, where you could go as well. Um, it, it's 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 listen. It's a it's a hard sell. The, the big thing is come and 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 see what it is. You, you know what I mean? So yeah, it, I'd like to see some some traveling gatherings. I think when I first started fighting over twenty years ago um you know as new yorkers it's like you know we're spending a lot of freaking money to go out to california let's have an east coast gathering and back then you know the tribe wasn't as big so it's like oh then now you're going to split the tribe and then you guys aren't going to want to come to california you're just going to stay on the east coast so it was like a whole thing so it took you know over 30 years to even like uh you know contemplate the idea of like yeah let's bring the show on the road and you know not everyone's for it but i still think it's worth doing it uh, for me, the tribal should still be in California. I mean, just kind of that's kind of the the holy. <laughs> not that it's a religious thing, but you know that's the kind of the, the birthplace, and you know, there's a lot of good fighters out there. Not downplaying yeah, anyone, anyone out in Canada. I'm not downplaying anything in Europe because hmm. a lot of great fighters uh, all around. Um, yeah, even that, even that in itself, like you know, you know, sled dog in Canada is like you know you're not going to make full dog brother just fighting at Canadian gatherings go to Europe and go to America because you're used to everyone here and there's just different people that you got to fight, you know? Mm. So, you know, I appreciate that, that sled did that. Um, so, you know, I fought at plenty of, you know, uh, gatherings in Canada and, and more so in, in, in uh, Cali and next year, Switzerland. And I think we're to bring Aaron, make a family trip out of it. Oh, lonely, wow. Uh, lonely kind of gave a little blessing to let him fight. So, uh, I mean, the kid's a beast. <laughs> he's he uh, he's 16, he's big, 12, but, you know, but it's got to be a controlled way. And, and it's not, listen, it's not a kid's sport. Like, you know, a kid shouldn't be, you know, fighting. It's, you know, there's certain people where, you know, you, you're growing up as a full dog brother in that household and, 
you know, it's not just uh, like a patty cake type of thing. It's taken with seriousness. And mm. even my son knows, oh, dad, I can't go there and fight. I'm not, you know, I'm not a dog, bro. I can't, you know, it's like, all right, you got an exception. You know what I mean? So it's, you know, he appreciates what it is because he understands what it is. And it's mm. not just, um, you know, it's, it's a spe- it is a special thing. But, you know, ho- hopefully we could do some some traveling gatherings more so if you could help pe- direct people to us where we could connect them to people yeah. close by the train like I, I again i think i i think we the zoning in, in uh in kentucky so i mean yeah whoever's interested just reach out to dean and he can get you in touch with us and you know we could just try to set you up with the right people you know that's the, i think that's the first step i mean you know if you're serious about it you're, you're going to show up and do it you know there's there's you know the dog brothers martial arts association where there's fights you could watch there. You know, there's fights on YouTube. There's you know training material uh, on the website. Um, you know, but at, at some point you got to be willing to do it yourself as well. You know, so mm-hmm. if you're serious about it, reach out and inquire, and and you know sometimes be persistent. You know, I mean, um, uh, you know, I don't think you'll, you would reg- regret it if it's not for you and you try it. You don't like it? No, no shame. No one's gonna. No, for you but i think even people that i've met over the years who have done it and only have done one gathering like that's enough for me but like i'm glad i did it. at least i know listen at least you know because i think a lot of people walk around with a false sense of security like oh, i don't really need to chain train weapons i'm just gonna pick up the stick crack them once the fight's over oh no it's it's not and if if it's someone with violent intent who doesn't really give an ish about their life or they're committed on, I'm going to kill you and I need to eat and I'm hopped up on drugs. You're going to be in for a rude awakening. So, I mean, you know, a season yeah. of my, as I am in a fighter, it's like, I, I don't want to get in the fights in the street. I mean, it's, no, I know, right. You know what know, I'm capable of, but it's, it's not, you know, it's not a pretty thing. And it's not, people, I think, have a very false sense of what they train and, and how they're actually going to bring it to fruition in, in, in an adrenal state. Um, when someone else is when you really need to use it so no, again no, a healthy way to to practice it um again it's a family barbecue it really is it it took a long time for me to really get there um but for for you for, for to be able to fight in that deep of a state be that controlled and help guide people up just make them kind of shit in their pants a little bit so they grow from it and then you have those fights where it's someone's got 40 pounds on you and you know the, you know tough fucking person that you could release more on you know and it's yeah. you know it's a beautiful thing i mean it's we all have our struggles you know in life and I'm not saying that they're, they're so bad what we go through now but you know you got to vent it out you know a lot of us get stuck behind the computer the keyboard and all the rules of society and this is acceptable and this is a toxic male and this and that you know, I think it's a healthy place for you just to go out to be you. And and again, there's women who fight too. So, you know, mm-hmm. part of Dog Brothers, you know, is heart, mind, and balls. So, I don't know, heart, mind, and ovaries. Or some of the jokes I'd make with the women is, well, those are the things you aim for. Aim for the heart, mind, and balls when you're fighting. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but they seem okay with it. I mean, you know, some, some uh, you know, in, in the ascension process, I kind of just developed that way where some people, they want to be called a cat. Uh, some people, some some of the women, like no, I want to be called a bitch. Okay, if that's if that's what you want, you know. I mean, um, let me tell you something. In the beginning, it was really only women were only allowed to fight with with knives against men. So it's you know less physical contact, and you're really mm. treating trying to treat it more as a blade. But you know now you know there's there's more you know of fighting with you know women women and men. You know, we try to do it for the most part with a full dog brother who has more control. Yeah. Um, but let me tell you, there's some some tough, tough women in the tribe. I mean, no, no joke. Yeah, I believe I mean, there's some yeah. really, really tough women. It's and it's impressive. Yeah, I'm not surprised that you guys developed that and all that. Uh, this, um, this, all right, a couple questions before. Uh, this has been super. Um, okay, these are kind of like quickies, uh, fun. All right, uh, Matt. If you could train in that FMA style and you had the time, you had the resources, you could do it. What other FMA style would you train? The science style, Corto Cadena. If I had the time and the money, 
I would fly to Oakland and I would train back and you forth. Train with Jay, uh, Jay and Maya. Yeah. Jay and Maya. Oh yeah. Okay. Big time. Okay. Big time. That's that's the easiest easiest question you could ask me. I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I have a lot of admiration for those guys. I've only gotten to train um, in person with Maya one time, and um, every aspect of that day was like awesome. Yeah. And no, uh, so I I yeah I have a lot of respect for those guys, and I really. Um, I look forward to uh, the day when I will have, you know, the flexibility to get out to open. That you can go out there and do it. No, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Same question yep. for you, Steve. If there were, if you had the time, the resource, the interest, what FMA style would you like to check out or or see what it's about? Uh, there's a there's a lot. I mean, there's there's a, a ton. Um, I really couldn't single it out. I mean, I've always kind of been a little interested in. Uh, uh, Kalisi's Illustrissimo. I trained a little bit. Um, yeah. It's interesting because it's really more of a blade art, and there's some yeah. interesting yeah. things that I've learned from from Full Dog Brothers from a, a fighting perspective on actually how to use some of this stuff that I thought was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a lot of styles, you know, and I, I, I think you know, like you know, going to Dan Inosano's seminars, it's like he'll talk to you for six hours straight about like this little twist in the punch. And like the 50 different styles he trained it in. I think the more you go out there and train, and I've trained a lot of different styles, you see a lot of those similarities, but there's still a lot of unique, you know, approaches that, that you learn. But the the filter or or the term the, the 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 filter glass you're looking through is I'd prefer to learn it from someone who's actually fought. So I've I've learned a lot from other people in the tribe who've trained these different arts, who've explained it to me. In a, in a different mindset than the, just doing the drill. Like, this is how you actually would fight with it type of thing. Mm. Um, just in general, I mean, I'd like to have more time to train. I mean, I don't have the time to train that I really used to when I was back in college and whatnot. Mm. Um, but at the end of the day, kind of like when you're doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, like once you get to blue belt, you kind of know all the techniques already and it's uh, constantly evolving. Then when you get to purple belt, you're kind of boiling it down to – your system and your your style that works for you and that's kind of where i am with my fighting now it's like i'll talk to someone like for six hours about the most basic technique and all the little variants and the angle and the distance and that and it and you know like map things out geometry and this and that but then when i go out and fight it's just like it's like oh, i don't really know any techniques i just go out and fight and that's i think like the, the higher level of the art when you just go out and you don't think about it and you just kind of do it but but it's Again, it's because you're learning the, the, the those primal skill sets first. So there's a lot to learn. I mean, there's a lot to the art that I'd like to, to, to learn. I'll be honest with you. I, I know a lot, and I've been fortunate to have learned from a lot of different people mm. that I'd like more time to train and drill in a realistic way so to actually bring these techniques out into a gathering. Because there's a lot more that I know that I think is fight-worthy that I could make work in gatherings. I just need the flight time to actually do it. Do the time. I got you. Yeah. Yeah, I got and again, you. And again, it's, again, I could do it against this guy and that guy, but let me see how I could do it against the next, you know. Yeah, the, yeah. No, yeah. Okay, next quick question. Um, uh, you probably you might already answer this, Matt, but we'll throw it at you anyhow. Uh, if you could pick one person in FMA uh, that you could just train with, it, could be, it doesn't matter, style, but just you had access carte blanche flight paid for everything you could just go and just train with this guy or or gal who would it be um i yeah i i stick with uh wanting to train with maya and jay um both of them are just really really impressive with their movement and they have um their own <laughs> each of them has their own lens on mm. that style and uh yeah, that's the pro probably them. Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. I've never gotten to train with Lonely Dog, so within the Dog Brothers world, Lonely Dog is someone that uh, at some point that you would like to. Like, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, big time. Um, but you know, and I, when it comes to other styles, um, yeah, It'd be uh, Maya J. Yeah, yeah, Maya, Maya J. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I'm, yeah, I had a good time training with uh, Maya when I when I came out to see you that time, and I, I was really impressed with her. It's like you know, don't smash my knuckles. I'm like no, no, it's gonna be controlled, relax. You know, she said the exact same thing to me. She goes, "Don't break my fucking hands." 
<laughs> I was yeah, like, okay. I'm completely impressed by how she operates with the blade and just how deceptive she is and like uh, how she could evade and not get hit and cut me like so many times is uh it was interesting you know and listen i learned i learned from uh, so many people from the dog brothers but like you know out of the founding fathers i really didn't get much time uh to train with salty dog um uh, you know he's been a, a tremendous you know influence on what we do but i haven't actually had time to really train with him you know directly mm -hmm. there's so many other honestly plenty of people outside the tribe but i wish i had more time just to train with the people in the tribe right because we all know how we're going to utilize it and they all have the experience of utilizing it adrenally and there's so many different styles represented at a gathering yeah. there's just so much there and yeah lonely dog's amazing they you know i've been fortunate to have a few times to to have trained with him you know in person um it's just it's so many people, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah, definitely yeah, so many people. but again, I, I'd really prefer it to be from the filter of someone who's actually fought, you know what I mean? Because yeah. it's like, all right, that, that, that's, that's something that's very important to me is from Dog Brothers Martial Arts. You see it taught, you see it fought. Again, I've learned gazillion disarms and you go to Top Dog, he teaches you them. Yeah, hey, grab the arm like this, you go like this, you go like that, and it's disarm one, two, and three, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you take, you take, and what, what is, uh, a uh, grand two on uh, guy say, yeah, to take this arm, you know, just take it off, you know. Yeah, there's your best, right? Your best disarm, right? <laughs> but you know, then then you look at the trapping range stuff, right? Mm -hmm. When those corto range and all, all those ranges happen so quickly, and it took me years just to get like deal with someone's power caveman and just to get one checking hand in so I could get another shot. Where does it apply when you go to the ground? Because when you're in the ground, you actually have the ability to do more of that cordial range stuff. I can't mm -hmm. run away, and you're at this kind of awkward distance. So unless you're, you know, hugging, hugging each other, you do have a little bit more opportunity to pull off a couple more of those cordial range uh, moves. But people don't think about it that way when they're doing, you know, hoobud drills and whatnot. You know, it's like, you know, you're on the ground. Do your hoobud drill right there. You got the opportunity trying to cave the guy's head, and he's going to block, right? So you got more of an opportunity down there. That's yeah, why their mobility is compromised. That's a good point. Can't argue that. <laughs> uh, well, this has been wonderful, you guys. I um, I hope you, time goes by fast when the conversation is all good. We're close to two hours and fifteen minutes, um, so this is definitely on the longer end. But you guys, uh, you guys are rock stars tonight. Um, I appreciate you guys uh, doing this, and I want to get more on. Renee's going to come back on. I'm going to have to bring Renee back on. Um, and that'll be interesting. Did you lose a bet or something? <laughs> yeah. Uh, before <laughs> can we got uh, Matt's can we agree on anything? Matt's fighting is amazing. Yeah, I don't think you'll find anybody that won't agree with that. Um uh yes, it was a good discussion, Danny. Agreed. Uh closing thoughts. Uh Matt, closing thoughts. Oof. Uh <clears throat> well, I would say uh if this conversation hasn't chased you off uh, entirely and you're going to be in the northeast this summer um, you know hit, hit us up whether you're close to new york city whether you're close to you know uh, new england um, reach out and 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 find us uh steve and myself are both guys that are willing to reach take out a little time to yeah reach out and touch um <laughs> we're both guys that are willing to make a little bit of time for people um you know that that want to take a look at the art a little bit or um, you know, spar a little bit, whatever. Um, and uh, hopefully this summer, <clears throat> I'm going to, uh, I, I need to iron out a date exactly and, and um, you know, figure it out. But I have a pretty good location to, to um, scrap where uh, the police already know me. So we don't have any issues, but uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to having a, a decent sparring day this summer and it would be very cool if, uh, we get some people from other systems in the area to, to travel um, travel up. You know, anybody that uh, is coming into the area that's looking for accommodations or whatever, let me know, and we can figure something out for you. And, um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to uh, to get it out there. Like, like I said, it's for anybody. It's not for everybody. If it's not for you, like Steve said, there's no shame in that as well. Mm. But um, I think it's worth giving it a, giving it a whirl. And uh, so, um, yeah, and also, if I, uh, before I talk to you again, Matt, just again, if uh, Jeff 
and you just want to do something or if you can get the um the yeah, other we'll, there uh just yep. yeah let me know if you guys are interested yeah. in doing that um, yeah we'll put something together for sure um and then uh so uh, same thing steve closing thoughts uh you know listen i, I think you know we, we've uh COVID kind of threw a lot of things off. You know, a lot of people from my training group moved back mm. to Denmark and they moved back to this state, that state, you know, all over. And, you know, I think we made a lot of good connections with other groups pre-COVID. You know, Sonny Mayo, got to see you again. And, you know, everyone who trains with you, good people. Um, actually, Beowulf was there. I'm excited to see Beowulf again. It's been a long time. He, he came down that one time with that sparring day with Sonny, and there's been a bunch of them. You know, I started making connection with our group, uh, with some other local, like, PTK groups and, uh, you know, some other organizations in, uh, as well. We started developing um, some some kind of, you know, relationship where we get together a little bit and, you know, kind of hoping to rekindle that and, you know, help it, gr you know, grow a little bit further and, and kind of pick up kind of where we left off and whatnot. Um, you know, looking forward to the tribal coming up. I'm not in great shape, but, you know, I'll get in good enough shape to, to go out. Um, and again, it's, yeah, for me, uh, I mean, you know, I'm, ex I'm excited to be doing this. Um, you know, so many people help shape who I am, you know, a, as a person. Uh, and I, you know, I really appreciate that. You know, I know a lot of times what we do, uh, you know, a lot of egos involved at times and this, and that, the next thing, but, you know, I've learned something from everyone, you know, good, bad, and different. Uh, you know, for the most part, it's been really good. And um, again, what we do at these gatherings, I think is extremely, you know, healthy, especially in today's day and age where, you know, I, I'm not on social media anymore. You know, this country is completely like split and divided. But, you know, to get together with, with a group of people who have such diverse backgrounds and, you know, ideologies, beliefs, but could share something so deep uh, without any of that bullshit, you know, none of that keyboard warrior shit. None of, no one's trying to shove their ideologies down your throat. We're out there sharing in something in a very genuine way where we really are trying to make each other better. Yeah. We're going out mm -hmm. there. Things could break. Yeah. I mean, shit happens, but I mean, the whole idea is that we're a unified tribe trying to grow together. And, um, like I said, if I was just doing any other kind of combative art, I'd I'd be done already. I mean, I'm I'm gonna be 45 this year, but I'm definitely gonna be fighting into gatherings into my 60s without a doubt. So you know, just uh, I know others have committed to that as well. So uh, you know, we'll get our cane fights in and whatnot. <laughs> Looking forward to that over the years, and yeah, yeah, just to see my son do it. And in, in, uh, you know, I fought my son at the last beat the crap out of cancer. You know, he did rattan for the first time. It's like, all right, it's enough with the padded sticks because uh, you're going to learn not to block with your head. You know, they might have been, you know, thinner sticks. But, yeah, you know, kid came out. I was, you know, very proud. After the fight, I'm like, oh, give me a nice bruise on the rib, on the leg, you know. How does your head feel? How does your head feel? It's like, yeah, my ears are still ringing for 10 minutes. But, uh, uh, but you, know, it's, you know, as a father, you know, to, to share that, you know, with, with your son, it's a, you know, Baseball's cool, but you know this is a, a different level of bonding. Um, yeah, it means a lot to me. You know, to, to awesome. yeah, yeah, yeah. and again, it's it's a, it's a tribal thing. Like you know, Matt, you know, <laughs> teeping him across the, the mat at six years old. I mean, that you know, that kind of experience for him as a kid. I mean, growing up, you know, helped him develop to who he is now. You know what I mean? And listen, he's a little kid, he's going up and he's asking, you know, guys bigger than me, hey, you want to fight? Yeah, granted, softer sticks and whatnot, but, you know, for, for a kid to have that level of confidence, I think it's, you know, an important thing. You know, bull yeah. is a real thing. Um, you know, I was very adamant about my son that, you know, you will not bully anyone because <laughs> then you're going to deal with me. <laughs> mm. You know, to, to, to be, you know, mindful of those around you to, to prevent bullying and stand up to that. Um mm. You know, I'm yeah, proud I'm of a lot of times in his life where, where he had to do that. And he did it in a way where he didn't have to be aggressive, just with the confidence, that the, the air of confidence, not arrogance. It's just the confidence people know, like, you know, you know, you know, the, well, it's the saying it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in war. It's just a, it's, yeah. a, it's a skill of life. You should know how to ride a bike. You should know how to swim. I mean, you should know how to fight. I mean, it's, you know, amongst a, a plethora of other things. I mean, it just, um, yeah, yeah, basic basic skill sets, right? We don't yeah. we don't hunt and gather anymore, right? I mean, this we don't have tribal battles, but 
kind of the way we were developed was for that. So for us to get together and, you know, howl under the moon and uh, and do this, mean, it means a lot to us. And the people who do it, we know what it means. And from the, from the people from the outside, they really don't get it until they start showing up. Mm -hmm. And again, I just, if you guys could show up, you know, <laughs> um, just watch, just come and watch, you know what I mean? Any of these events, don't feel obligated to fight it, beat the crap out of cancer, anything. Just, just meet with some of us, get to know us, train, and, you know, we'll help guide you, you know, uh, on a path if you're serious about it. So, you know, through Dean, he'll get you in touch with, with Matt and, and I, and, you know, we'll, we'll help get you in touch with other dog brothers from around the world. I mean, you know, there's people on here from the UK, it's, a lot of people out in the UK doing it. Europe, it's huge out there. So it's mm. people for us to help connect you with. So our pleasure to help, you know, guide you in your journey. Awesome, awesome. Um, and uh, and you can see for 1990, Fox Sounds only falls the Fox Hall for 1999. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> oh. uh, I'm just gonna bring mine just for entertainment sake. <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna even ask some questions. Okay, Renee, just uh, pick just on go. somebody. You know, just go ahead. <laughs> I'm gonna sit back here and uh, we'll let the audience just. Uh... Oh, man. But hey, I want to. I appreciate you guys coming on. This is uh, this has been great. I'm glad we were able to make it happen. Um, I'm glad, uh, you know, that uh, I actually asked you at the barbecue place. Uh, Steve, that if you want to come on, because uh, we know uh, Nick, you know, and all that, but we we kind of covered that uh, what Nick mentioned to me some time ago. <laughs> and yeah, uh, I didn't really talk much, but you know, uh, listen, I appreciate you having me on, and you know, I really yeah. appreciate and have admired what you've been doing over the years. Uh, you know, I've been following you from the beginning, even though I'm not really on social media much. I still, you know, poke in and see see your videos and whatnot that you have on uh, on YouTube and. Yeah, listen, it's uh, it's it's tremendous. You know, there's you know a few people you can count on your fingers that have done a tremendous amount from Filipino martial arts, and I'm not going to say you're Dan Inosano, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, know. I mean, obviously, you know, but what were you doing to help document it and, and uh, you know, spread spread the, the word about different systems and give people a platform to speak out? It, it is tremendous, and. Um, Again, I wish, you know, the, the, the styles I never even heard of before. I wish you guys would show up at a gathering. Just just come and watch. Come, mm. Just come and watch. That's it. Don't, you know, take it from there, you know. Awesome, awesome. Absolutely. Well, also, I'll be in touch with you guys um, for another, hopefully, event in Connecticut. And hopefully, um, I've made a discussion going on the road, trying to do something with you guys as well in your geographic area. So, uh, cool. yeah, so definitely won't. Renee said 45. <laughs> I feel like I'm 65 with what I've done to my body over the years. Oh, he's what's gonna man. happen when I really am 65? Uh, you know what? I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't give it up for anything. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have changed anything differently. Man, he's freaking funny, but uh, awesome. But uh, yeah, very uh, high end ball gas. Yeah, it was a good one. Thank you, Brett, for jumping in. Absolutely. I appreciate everyone uh, yeah, watching, yeah. sharing comments and questions. But uh, all right, awesome guys. Well, we'll be in touch, and uh, you know, and uh, I wish you guys. Uh, I'll talk to you soon. Oh, Matt uh, looks like he uh, dinner's ready. <laughs> dinner's getting cold. yeah. Or there was definitely an internet glitch. Um, like yeah, for him to something must have happened there. But uh, woof. And, uh, yeah, all right. Uh, but again, yeah, I'm so glad you, you came out. I uh, jumped on, Steve. Um, if I had known this, man, I would have got you on freaking sooner. <laughs> um, but uh, hey, better late than never, right? Um, so, but all right, hey, hopefully, we'll I'll see you soon. We'll be in touch. You know? Definitely tell your son I say hi. <laughs> I will, yeah, yeah, you want to be here with me. <laughs> all right, but uh, you Thank take you. care, man. All right. So long. All right. That wraps up. Yeah. Long one on huh, tonight, but Hey, I think well worth it. I think these guys do. I'm support them 100%. If you guys already figured that out, I just think what they do and what they instill, you know, breaking that myth that you're going to go there and 
get hurt. I mean, you know, if you have a bad attitude, you can go there. Yeah, it could happen. But if you're like my, if you're kind of like me, humble, low key, they're not going to just throttle you and start beating on you and, um, and all that. Ryan will tell you, Ryan's here. Some of the other guys that do that. So and just healthy, the healthy people will be around. No egos. They're just healthy people to really be around. And, um, you know, especially with me dealing all the crap, I sometimes deal with every discussion on the back end, things that I don't make privy to everybody, the messages I get, or you see some of the stuff that goes on that discussion. Sometimes it's just, these are just great people to be around. <laughs> just make it, you know, you, you know, just make it worthwhile to keep doing what I'm doing. Um, and so, but yeah, at any rate, if you got questions regarding them and what's coming up as far as events and all that, please do message me and I'll keep you in the loop. All right, folks, I have no idea who's on next. Um, I can tell you who I might be doing next, but I have no idea who's like what Brian or Tom, who's coming on. Um, I, however, though, will be trying to get, I got the 52 ways block system, African uh, MPN system there, 52. I know I'm probably missing a word out of that um, as far as the actual... Uh, you're the, <laughs> uh, thank you, Ryan. You're a man too. I yeah, look forward to seeing you next next time, or hopefully soon, sooner and later. Uh, but I can tell you, I got that. Um, I'm trying to get Guru Burton's going to be coming on. We're going to be talking at the end against knife. Um, Chris Durbaum, Kuntao guy. I have to touch base with him. Uh, a few other guys, yeah. But uh, hopefully, uh, 50. Thank you, Robert. 52 blocks. I don't know how I screwed that up. But anyway, yeah, getting somebody to come on and talk about that, which I can't wait. I'm, you know, I'm fascinated with different systems, and that. So I'm looking forward to that. But uh, yeah, folks, uh, again, thank you for uh, jumping in, watching, and we'll see you soon. All right, take care.